Greetings. Good morning. Good morning. We are live streaming, so let's uh, stay on mute for now. If you have any questions, just let me know in the chat. Understood.
Alt space, go ahead with audio test. What test one, two, three? Coming through loud and clear. Great. James? Hello? Hello, Maria. Good morning. Oh, Good morning. But finally, there is somebody there. I've been connected for 15 minutes now. <laughs> Glad to have you aboard. Uh, we'll get started in about four minutes. Susan, you can introduce you. Okay, so I see that the title is wrong for my presentation. It's not the one that we agreed, but doesn't matter. Oh, I can fix that. What is it? Exploration from Leo to Moon and Mars. I will fix that. Presented this soon? Yeah. Quindi, could I share screen? Please, could you share screen? Can I share the screen already? Um, yeah, if you want to do a quick test, sure. Yeah. Go ahead. Let me try. You cannot share screen while the other participant is sharing. I cannot. Hold on one second. Okay, go ahead and try now. I'm trying. Can you see my presentation? Not yet. Yeah. Oh, it's loading now. Okay. Yes, we can see it now. Okay. Should I check uh, if you see my camera? Uh, yeah, you can go ahead and turn that on. Okay. Can you see me? Yes, I can see both of you. <laughs> my you son know? is, uh, you know, the technician. You might want to lower the camera a little bit so her she's framed in the. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. That's perfect. Thank you. Okay. Yes. No. Okay. 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 Uh, we can start in about two minutes. Susan, the one already see. Will you present me or should I introduce myself? Susan Martin will be introducing you. Okay. Yeah. Ciao, Susan. Greetings, Maria. Welcome. Thank you. I'm tired. It's yeah. late, late evening here. Yeah. Anyway. James, can you also correct uh, my affiliation and title? This is Penny Boston. Hi. Absolutely. Thank you, sweetie. I put it in the chat. I'll, I'll take care of that right now. Thank you, dear. Bye. Mm -hmm. James, all the other people are connecting in remote or somebody's there in presence? We're a 100% virtual event. Everyone is connecting from all over the world. Okay. So anybody can have troubles, basically. Uh, that's true. Anyone can have troubles or, or not. Okay, <laughs> <have> good. <laughs> okay. Okay, Susan, whenever you're ready. All righty. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second day of the Mars Society's 2021 convention. I have the distinct honor uh, and pleasure of introducing today's plenary speakers. Our first speaker is uh, Maria Antoinetta Perino, and she is the director of the Space Economy Exploration and International Network at Talis Alenia Space. Maria, welcome. 
Thank you, Susan. Thanks uh, for inviting me to join this uh, conversation about uh, exploration. So let me first uh, tell you that uh, I'm going to share for the next uh, 20 minutes or so what uh, the company for which I work at Tales Serenia Space uh, in Italy, in Torino, um, has been doing uh, to sustain exploration, let's say, for, from the last uh, 20 plus years. Uh, so our path started from uh, the low Earth orbit, uh, and then we are moving quickly uh, toward the moon uh, with the objective to reach Mars as soon as possible. Uh, why do we start from the International Space Station? Because we truly believe that uh, the International Space Station is key to prepare and develop the capabilities that will be required for the deep uh, for missions in this space. Why that? Because uh, there we learn how to live and work in a different environment. There we operated all the elements that we build uh, for the International Space Station. So the pressurized modules, uh, we, we learn how to operate the payloads. We learn how to perform logistic operations. And the International Space Station is still valid to validate uh, new advanced technologies that are required for missions that are even more challenged uh, than the current one. And also the International Space Station can be regarded as a test bench, as a laboratory uh, where we can complement the R&D activities that we are performing on ground. And finally, uh, and this is very important, uh, the International Space Station uh, is a place where we can understand uh, how humans can adapt uh, to live in space. And there we can understand which are the gaps uh, that are still to be filled. Gaps from a technological point of view, from a physiological point of view, and especially from a psychological point of view. I just wanted to give you a flavor eh, of uh, uh, our Italian contributions to the space station. Uh, you see here the different elements, mainly uh, pressurized elements uh, that we deliver to the International Space Station. And we are very proud to say that uh, out of 135 shuttle flights, more than half of them carried hardware, including scientific experiments that we built in Torino. So we are very, you know, we are humble, but very proud eh, to contribute to this international uh, need that we all share to explore further, eh, moving from lower orbit to Moon and Mars. And in fact, this is precisely the approach that uh, all the space agencies, uh, all the players eh, in our field, uh, has decided to, to, to perform uh, uh, for the few next years. In fact, exploration is regarded as a multi-step approach. Uh, we have to learn uh, the places we are going to explore, first uh, by sending robotic automatic uh, um, spacecraft that will collect the needed information to develop the systems and the technologies required to sustain life on another planet. And uh, to be able uh, to go back to the moon and farther on, um, we are currently contributing to the development of the new transportation system. Europe, in fact, is uh, um, developing the European service module uh, of the Orion uh, Space Launch System. And our company, together with Airbus, uh, our company is designing and building, manufacturing uh, the propulsion, the electrical system, the thermal control, and the consumables. As for the Gateway, we are also super busy there. Uh, the Gateway is a small space station uh, that we orbit uh, in moon vicinity. Uh, the initial modules uh, that are under construction already are the power and propulsion module and the habitat and logistic outpost. Uh, regarding the last one, uh, our company is welding in these days 
the primary structure, uh, including the micrometeoroid protection. Uh, so you see that uh, we have a background uh, in pressurized modules, and uh, we are you know, glad to apply uh, our knowledge uh, to find solution for the new challenges for deep space habitat. And in fact, uh, we got two important, recently we got two important contracts uh, from the European Space Agency. Um, we are prime uh, for the international uh, habitat that will be launched uh, in 2026, very similar to ALO, uh, three meter, meter diameter, two radial ports, equipped with uh, radiators, uh, to dissipate uh, uh, seven, eight kilowatt of power. And uh, as Thales Alenia Space in France, we are prime for the X3 uh, module. Ah, I forgot to mention that uh, we, we are paying, you know, deep attention to uh, new solutions for the internal architecture, but in one of two biographs, I will share with you uh, some solutions. So going back to Esprit, uh, our colleagues in France uh, are currently designing and, and manufacturing it. Uh, Esprit will uh, provide um, the gateway with the communication and the refueling uh, and cargo module system. Okay, and this picture is, speaks by itself, uh, will be a privilege for you know, the new astronauts uh, uh, orbiting around the moon uh, to look back and see uh, our planet uh, from a close distance, because a different story will be uh, when the astronaut will travel toward Mars. So the gateway as for the International Space Station will be the summa of, uh, uh, how can I say, um, a fruitful international collaboration. You see here uh, all the uh, countries, uh, all the players that are uh, going to provide uh, the different elements uh, of this beautiful uh, uh, assembly. And uh, beside uh, seeing many uh, American uh, elements, uh, I like to underline that also Europe and JAXA uh, are, are, uh, and, and Roscosmos obviously uh, are going to contribute to the final uh, configuration. Uh, coming back to the habitats, uh, we, uh, we are moving from, uh, uh, how can I say, the current uh, uh, internal layout of the space station, so super busy, uh, everything is all around you, uh, to new habitat internal uh, architecture solution, uh, because we truly believe that the astronauts living far from Earth will uh, need uh, to feel home in a very comfortable environment. So the Gateway is offering us the possibility to anticipate as much as possible smart solution and new technologies to meet this objective. The volumes are constrained. So we need uh, you know, to be smart, to be clever, uh, but the new technologies are helping us um, because, you know, solutions that were not possible until a few years ago uh, are coming uh, possible now. I'm referring to 3D printing capabilities, to virtual reality, to augmented reality. Uh, all these technologies, in fact, um, will be are already part of our new design. So the key differences uh, in this slide um, between uh, the modules of the International Space Station and the current modules for the Gateway are listed here. We have uh, to optimize the mass, uh, in particular for the primary structure. We plan to use uh, new docking ports, smaller, uh, based on international standards. Uh, we can have a lighter meteorite protection uh, because there are no debris. Um, we are conceiving new lightweight secondary structure that uh, uh, will offer the possibility to the astronaut to, how can I say, to change the internal uh, outfitting. Uh, 
a key issue uh, is the radiation protection. Uh, the environment outside is harsh and uh, uh, we are developing new solutions uh, using new materials, including water, uh, water walls, as you can see here. Um, we need to implement an autonomous thermal control. Uh, we need uh, to provide uh, a new uh, modular avionics uh, and tether architecture. And you see here uh, what I mentioned before, uh, the water wall uh, for radiation protection. This is one of uh, uh, the internal layouts we are studying. Uh, as you can see, the, the dimension uh, of the habitat are small, uh, but we can fit uh, uh, all the functions uh, uh, that are needed. Uh, private uh, group waters, light support system, uh, the toilet here, uh, the kitchen, small kitchen here with the table, and we have different places for uh, the scientific experiments. And these are the docking ports I mentioned before. Uh, from a functional allocation point of view, we are optimizing somehow the, how can I say, um, splitting the, the, yeah, the division between uh, a dirty, noisy uh, part of the space station and the clean, quiet one. So in HALO, uh, there will be the physical exercise uh, um, activity while uh, in the international habitation module uh, we plan to have uh, the social area and the private group water. Not only uh, we are studying not only uh, uh, the habitat uh, but many other building blocks uh, that uh, will be required uh, both on the lunar surface uh, and on the Martian surface. Starting from the lander, um, we are under contract of the European Space uh, Agency uh, to develop a cargo lander for the moon, the habitat I, I already mentioned. We are working on the in situ resource utilization and power gener generation systems. We are developing a design uh, of mobility system equipped with the pressurized module. So the typical pressurized rover to uh, offer, to guarantee the possibility for the crew uh, to explore in short sleeve uh, at you know, distances up to 100 kilometers from the base. And for sure, uh, we pay a lot of attention to uh, guarantee uh, telecommunication and navigation support functions. Uh, some uh, pictures regarding hardware that uh, we develop in house. Uh, so not only rigid solution for the habitat, but also deployable ones. Uh, this uh, uh, deployable system, as we all know, has the advantage of, uh, uh, you know, being launched in a stored configuration and then deployed uh, once in, uh, you know, in, in the proper location, um, gaining, you know, uh, uh, a good volume capability within the launch. And this is uh, real hardware, so not just the design, but the mock-up of our pressurized rover. Uh, many technologies here from the inflatable airlock to motor wheels, um, to vision systems uh, supported by uh, artificial intelligence. As for the life support system and let's say the food production, um, many activities in now related to greenhouses. Uh, recently, uh, we demonstrated uh, uh, one of our greenhouse in Antarctica. Uh, it worked beautifully and uh, uh, we plan to move from Antarctica to um, a lower Earth orbit and finally uh, to planetary uh, greenhouses. And we have uh, collaborations uh, in this uh, sense uh, to this end with the University of Arizona. Um, so many challenges. 
uh, low gravity, lack of atmosphere, cosmic radiation, abrasive regolith, uh, problems with uh, uh, eclipses, uh, many challenges, but altogether we can find the proper solutions. And these are uh, some of mock-ups and analogs that we have in Torino. Uh, I already mentioned uh, the pressurized rover. Um, I like to, to, to share with you uh, uh, an important information. In Torino, we have the Rover Control Center for the ExoMars uh, uh, rover, um, where we can you know, support uh, all the operations that will be performed on Mars. And this is the facility in Antarctica I mentioned before, where we tested our greenhouse. This is an internal picture. And uh, this is a mock-up of a new module for deep space uh, habitability. Why we do all these uh, technologies development? Because in fact, we are preparing for Mars. As we know, this is a beautiful NASA charts that recall us that uh, not the final objective, but the important objective is to go there, uh, to go to the red planet. And in fact, in, uh, in Europe, uh, all the European uh, uh, players uh, are busy uh, uh, working on ExoMars. Thales Selenium Space is uh, the prime contractor of the mission, uh, of the program, in fact, that is composed of two missions. The first one, uh, we launched uh, in 2016, March, uh, uh, the first part of, uh, of the program, the orbiter that is uh, um, currently orbiting around Mars and uh, gathering important information about the atmosphere of the red planet. Uh, so in particular, we are uh, getting many information concerning uh, methane uh, uh, that is present in, in the Martian atmosphere. Next year, uh, in the fall, we will launch the second part of the mission uh, that uh, will deliver uh, on the Martian surface a rover equipped with uh, a drilling system that uh, will drill down to two meters um, of that. Uh, to collect samples uh, of Martian terrain that will be analyzed in a laboratory on board the rover. Why we want to do that? Because as everybody else, we are interested in uh, looking for possible signs of uh, prebiotic life. So not only beautiful you know, pictures, colored picture, but real hardware, uh, these are some peaks uh, of the different uh, elements uh, of ExoMars. You see here the um, trace gas orbiter uh, that was launched uh, in 2016, uh, the entry, descent, and landing platform, Schiaparelli, uh, that despite the fact that, uh, as we know, uh, uh, didn't manage uh, to reach the surface uh, in a very quiet way. Uh, notwithstanding that, uh, during uh, the landing phase, uh, Schiaparelli was able to transmit, uh, to collect and transmit back Earth a lot of information regarding uh, the landing phase. And here you can see the rubble drill. Uh, you can see the analytic laboratory that uh, uh, will analyze the samples collected by the drill. And here you can see the glove box train uh, that we use to assemble uh, all the different components uh, of the ExoMars spacecraft. Uh, very proud to say that uh, uh, we are ready uh, for, for uh, uh, the second mission. Uh, all the different components uh, have been integrated and we are currently baking uh, the rover um, to guarantee, uh, to meet the, require, the planetary protection requirements. Uh, when we will move uh, to missions to Mars involving crew, uh, we will have uh, to meet many challenges. 
uh, it will not be easy to land. We will have to adapt and to find solution for reduced gravity. We will uh, uh, need to you know, get resources also from uh, the Martian atmosphere. There will be cosmic radiation, solar storms. We will have uh, to, to take into account the huge uh, problem of uh, resources, but above all, um, we will need to consider that that will be the first time that uh, people will, uh, uh, how can I say, uh, will uh, be so far away from Earth. So the psychological impacts uh, um, of this experience uh, uh, are still to be discovered. Uh, but I'm you know, sure that uh, the enthusiasm for being the first people traveling there uh, will, uh, will sustain uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, complement somehow uh, the, the, the feeling eh, of uh, uh, being so far from Earth. Uh, and so I like to conclude with uh, this uh, picture, uh, hoping that uh, all of us involved in this uh, conversation will have the privilege to see uh, the first steps on the Red Planet. And with that, I thank you all for listening to me. And uh, in case somebody likes to ask uh, uh, something, I am available for questions. Thanks a lot. Uh, Lyra, do you want to go ahead with questions from the Q&A panel? Yes, absolutely. Um, hi, Maria. Hope you can hear me. My name is Lara, and I'll ask you a couple of questions on behalf of the audience. Um, okay, so the first question is, is um, Talisalenia space developing any lending system for delivering hardware to the lunar surface? Yes, yes, I mentioned that before. In fact, uh, we, we got the contract uh, recently from the European Space Agency, um, EL3 uh, is the name, uh, European Lunar Landing System. Uh, yes, the delivering capability will be up to 1.5 ton. Uh, and uh, we, have, uh, we are studying currently different configurations to deliver cargo or payloads or you know, other uh, uh, items to the lunar surface. So the answer is yes. Thank you. Um, the second question comes from Dusty and they are saying, I love the greenhouse container in Antarctica. I tried to convince Kimball Musk to test his square roots there. What were the biggest challenges found? For example, energy consumption? Well, um, I didn't go there, unfortunately, but I spoke a lot with the colleague of mine who was there with the rest of the crew because they spend there the winter, you know, when life is, you know, super critical there. And they said that uh, uh, to have a greenhouse was such a plus uh, for the people there, uh, you know, to be focused on growing life from a psychological point of view is super important, uh, but also, you know, the pleasure to eat uh, fresh salad uh, was good. Is uh, demanding uh, to, to, to look after um, this type of system is demanding. Uh, he didn't report to me major problems, but for sure you need to care, you need to pay attention. All right, thank you. Um, another question comes from Fabrizio and they're saying, the drill is going to be of extreme importance for resources exploitation. Will engineering results such as drill and issue, soil strength, wear, and et cetera, be made available to the Mars community? Uh, I don't know if I got the point. Uh, you're asking guess, me, I, yeah. I guess the main question is, will the engineering results of the drilling be available to the Mars community? For and sure, for yeah. sure. Yeah, and it's really true that it's not so easy to drill 
uh, the Martian surface is not so easy. And in fact, I don't know if you see the cursor I'm moving, eh? but in this facility that we have in Torino, uh, in this location in particular, can you see the cursor? I don't know. If I move the cursor, can, it, can you see it? No. Um, yes or no? No, I, I, no. I cannot but see anyway, it. you see the, the picture uh, top right, is uh, the location where we are testing right now all the operations that the rover will perform, the ExoMars rover, we perform on the Martian surface, including drilling. So we are really testing uh, the, the engineering model of the drilling system. Uh, and, and yes, we, we had you know, to overcome a critical aspect and um, it's now is working perfectly. And yes, there will be a community, uh, a scientific community um, during the you know, uh, operation phase and the results for sure will be made available to the community at large. Thank you. And I guess um, we've got one question from the VR Alt Space. Yeah, hi Maria, are you able to hear us okay? I can hear you, yes. Very good. Uh, yeah, we're joining you from VR, and uh, we've got some beautiful models here in the room with us. Uh, we've got Ingenuity and MRO. I wanted to ask you, um, does the ESA, are they working on uh, doing more with uh, providing 3D models of their work by chance? I'd love to uh, have more of your, uh, your wonderful rovers and orbiters um, for us to, to engage the public with here in VR, if that's possible. So. Uh, I could put you, in, we are doing many activities in virtual reality for sure. Uh, we have a team of people working in that field. Uh, best thing I can do is to put you in contact. Fantastic, it's beautiful work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I can, I can complement the answer by sharing with you the fact that, in fact, we validate uh, all the new internal layout of any um, of our modules in virtual reality before moving to hardware um, solutions. So, and that is also true for the International Space Station. Uh, all the operations that the, the European astronauts perform uh, in the Columbus module, for example, are tested uh, in our virtual lab before to guarantee, you know, the man-machine uh, interfaces, mm. operability. Thank you. And I guess we have one um, time for one more question, although there is more. Um, but Stuart is asking, what are your plans for creating a Martian habitat? A Martian habitat on Mars or an analog? Um, I'm not sure, but <laughs> your, your answer can include both. Okay, uh, we are currently developing uh, um, different analogs uh, for different uh, uh, planetary surface elements. Uh, so rovers, habitats, uh, greenhouses, I already mentioned. So yes, we are working on analogs and mockups. Um, as for real hardware for Mars, not yet. Uh, for the habitats, not yet. But for the moon, yes. For the moon, yes. Uh, for Mars, uh, as you know, uh, all the elements of uh, the ExoMars program. So. Uh, for sure, orbiters, uh, rovers, uh, uh, drilling systems, uh, laboratories, uh, uh, yes, but habitat for Mars, uh, we are not welding them yet, unfortunately. Designing, yes, but not, you know, building. Maria, thank you very much for appearing with us this morning, and um, I'm afraid we're out of time. So we're going to proceed uh, to our next speaker. Who is a friend of mine. So I'm very glad to pass, you know, the baton to Jim, uh, from whom I learn many, many things. So it's a pleasure to be part of this uh, uh, conversation uh, where, you know, there are many friends uh, that share the same passion I have for exploration. 
Thank you. Thank you, Maria. All right, next up, our next speaker, as Maria alluded to, is Dr. James Green, NASA's chief scientist. And he's gonna to talk to us about ingenuity briefly and the future of flying on Mars. Uh, and so James, I'm handing it over to you and thank you for being with us today. Oh, my very great pleasure. Uh, let's uh, do a quick check. Can you see my charts? Yes. All right, super. Well, it's just a delight to be here uh, to uh, give you a short update on what's happening with Ingenuity, but also take time to think about the future. What could be next now that we've accomplished an enormous feat and flying on the red planet, the first off earth flight ever, all right? So what we have, of course, is um, landing, with curiosity, uh, pardon me, with perseverance, it, we go through the the, uh, the the crazy entry, descent, and landing with Sky Crane actually sitting it down on the surface, much like we did with Curiosity. That worked, of course, incredibly well. Uh, although um, perseverance looks very much like Curiosity, it is really quite different in all the instrumentation that it's doing with some similarities with many cameras uh, and, and a new function and that indeed is to core rock. Uh, these cores are uh, about the size of a chalkboard chalk. And for those uh, younger uh, audience uh, members uh, who don't know what a chalkboard chalk is, uh, we'll, we'll say like a large Crayola crayon. And so these, um, these cores, a uh, few inches long, three to four inches long, and uh, a, a, a beautiful diameter then are uh, broken off and then pulled out of the rock and then stuck in containers, which then are dropped or will be dropped in a collection after interrogation in, uh, of, of certain areas. We have an, a, a large number of tubes on board uh, where we can take samples. We have uh, 43 sample tubes and we've actually uh, taken three samples so far. Uh, two uh, rock samples and one atmospheric sample. Now, of course, Perseverance Rover is a fabulous mission because it's understanding a lot about the evolution of Mars geologically, you know, is the history book as you core rock and look back into time on what's happened to Mars. We know Mars was a blue planet. It was uh, like Earth uh, on the order of four billion years ago with vast oceans, a lot of water on the surface, and it went through rapid climate change. And hopefully the rock record will give us some hints as to when that occurred and how it may have occurred. But also within the rock record is, is potentially uh, evidence for ancient life, ancient microbial life. You know, there's 5,400 minerals or so here on Earth, and 350 of them or so can only be made by life. So indeed, that rock record may indeed contain uh, certain minerals for which uh, uh, ancient microbial life on, on the planet may have contributed to. So it's a fabulous mission that not only tells us that, a lot about that history, but goes after some potential life uh, elements that have been um, or would have been uh, deposited in the rock record. And that comes from returning those samples back to Earth where we can study them in, in, intently. And we also have a variety of instruments on board that help feed forward uh, in, uh, in the area of uh, human exploration. And one of them, I think, is really uh, ingenuity. Uh, the concept, of course, is that those samples will be uh, picked up by a fetch rover, brought over to a new system that will have been landed, which has a Mars ascent vehicle. Uh, then that uh, vehicle will be erected once it has acquired all the samples lofted. And then uh, a spacecraft built by the European Space Agency will capture it, hunt it down in orbit, capture it, and then return those samples to Earth for indeed intense analysis and investigation. 
Uh, we hope to be able to uh, uh, start this whole process of returning the samples and getting them back to Earth by late this decade or early next decade. Well, now I want to concentrate, of course, on Ingenuity, the fabulous technology demonstration mission that had a ride with Perseverance. Here you see uh, one of the views of Ingenuity. Uh, we've dropped the belly pan. It's, it's, it hasn't been dropped to the surface yet. It hasn't unfolded. But indeed, when that has been done, sits on the surface, uh, uh, Perseverance then, seeing that everything was set, moved away about uh, 50 meters or so. And then that enabled us to indeed start a variety of testing uh, 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 flights, all right? So what really do we have in terms of ingenuity? Well, it's only about four pounds. And in that, we have packed a variety of things, uh, uh, several cameras, a downward looking camera, an outward looking camera, uh, altimeter, um, uh, uh, the batteries are such that they're charged up by solar panels. The avionics, of course, has to be self-contained in the sense that uh, it receives information from its antenna from Perseverance, which gives it the software commands necessary to perform all the flights. And uh, the antenna and uh, uh, Perseverance uh, capability is such that we believe it could communicate perhaps as far away as a kilometer uh, from, uh, from uh, Perseverance. Only about four pounds, all right? Now, for our flights, uh, we went through five major test flights. Here is a, a beautiful view uh, of our third flight. Uh, this is uh, an L maneuver where we moved up, uh, then moved off to the side, uh, uh, almost as much as uh, 50 meters or so, and then returned to the spot where we were, where we've initially lifted off. Now, indeed, uh, uh, this is our first flight on another planet. Uh, this is a fabulous step forward. You know, we you, you, all the testing aside, you really don't know how it's going to work until it actually is on the planet. And indeed, it worked spectacularly well. Uh, what we see, of course, is um, um, the demonstration flights were the first five. Uh, it went through that uh, uh, period very well. Each of the flights had an increase in complexity, whether it was straight up down and then straight up L uh, and, then, and then jumping to a new landing site. And it pushed the limits not only of height, the ability to leave the surface uh, got up to 10 meters, which is pretty astounding, uh, but also in distance. Uh, you know, the, the fourth flight was uh, 271 meters total distance, but also in flight time. You know, so we gradually increased the flight time, really putting it through its tests. At the end of the five flights, it performed so well and it impressed not only uh, uh, the, the world and what it could do, but more importantly, the per Perseverance team, science teams, who really felt that it could be used as part of an operational scenario with Perseverance. What could it do? Well, it could look uh, for hazards, also special formations. So rover path planning could be facilitated by data from indeed uh, Ingenuity flights. And we find out we can take high resolution data uh, from Ingenuity and compare it with some of our other observations in particular from uh, uh, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter's high-rise instrument. So uh, next, let's see if I can, there we go. Here is a great example of that image comparison. So on um, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, we see on the left panel, uh, indeed a total image, you know, where that resolution is on the order of a little less than a, a, about three quarters of a meter per pixel. Uh, 
and then splotched right through the middle of it is a series of images uh, from Ingenuity. And we've blown that up on the right side and we can see the Ingenuity image in far greater detail. And of course that enables us to make comparisons with high rise and understand much more with this ground truth of the hazards, but also the exciting geological form formations that me, we may want to uh, uh, visit. Now here, after the first several flights, we really took off and went over area that had variations in height. You know, this is uh, uh, flight nine, you're watching flight nine, you're seeing the drifting and accumulation of the dunes. Uh, this height variation was very important to fly over to ensure that um, uh, we could accommodate that through the altimeter measurements as it, as it then makes decisions on board. Uh, absolutely a spectacular flight. Uh, the 10th flight was also unbelievably exciting in the sense that uh, we could take off. You see then as we uh, move towards the uh, these raised ridges, we actually made maneuvers, nearly a right angle turn, uh, you know, took uh, many images along the way as you're seeing this path and then followed that ridge back up and then moved, of course, uh, to a new uh, landing site. So really spectacular set of, uh, of uh, runs. These flights are, are, as we mentioned, even more complicated than the test flights and it's performing in a superb manner. Uh, the next thing is um, uh, one thing that was discussed, I'll mention it here uh, because I was very much involved in that discussion early on is uh, if we had Ingenuity uh, on the mission prior to launch, could it pick up the samples? This was a very intriguing idea, but because of course it was a technology demonstration capability, we decided that it, for, for uh, absolute ensuring the best possible uh, capability for uh, ingenuity, we would limit it only to uh, ensuring that we could fly on the surface of Mars, testing the limits of that flight. And, and then think about, of course, what would be that future? What else could it possibly do? So indeed, uh, Ingenuity doesn't have the ability to pick up these samples that are laid down, but potentially future opportunities in terms of retrieving material from future helicopters and then bringing that back to a certain location or base will be extremely important. Now, uh, as we move towards going to Mars, the current concept is that we're going to define an exploration zone, a location on Mars that is about 200 kilometers in diameter, uh, for which we'll land in one spot, we'll live in another spot, there'll be great opportunities for in situ resource utilization, and important to the scientists, really intriguing areas to study. And 200 kilometers is really, of course, uh, quite an enormous distance. So we anticipate that indeed, not only will humans have robotic vehicles in terms of rovers uh, with them, but they can indeed have uh, uh, helicopters with them. So Ingenuity, as I mentioned, was a four pound system, but we believe we can scale it up. Uh, perhaps by as much as a factor of 10. So a 40 pound helicopter can be a significant and have a significant advantage in terms of exploring uh, Mars in new and important ways. Well, this idea is not new. Before we even launched Perseverance, uh, many of us in NASA worked with the National Geographic a group that were developing a, a series called Mars. And here's, an, here's a little movie that's out of that, that uh, uh, segment. Uh, here you see uh, uh, a controller. The controller is indeed getting ready 
to uh, uh, launch a whole variety of helicopters. And the key element that they're doing is indeed uh, looking for skylights, looking for collapsed lava tubes for which then the humans will move from a surface space down into a, uh, a lava tube area. And of course, what's exciting about the opportunity to find a lava tube, even on Mars today, where the future might be, the helicopter can go into a lava tube and interrogate it, making measurements of temperature and pressure, but also humidity and maybe even uh, microbial uh, uh, life could be detected in, in, or in these lava tubes much like we see it, of course, in caves here on Earth. Now, other things that uh, we're really excited about in terms of uh, uh, potential activities that helicopters could do is really illustrated in the reoccurring slope lineage. Okay, that's, a, <clears throat> that's shown in these four images. Uh, these are from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. There's uh, four distinct seasons. They're put on top of each other. And so we have summer, uh, fall, oh, sorry, we have, let me do this again. So here we, here we have in each of these a, a seasonal view. We have winter, spring, summer, and then fall. And so what they show you is these, uh, these lines, these streaks that emanate down crater walls. The very right side is the top of the crater, the very left side is the bottom of the crater and these uh, reoccurring slope lineae are there. Uh, there's been a lot of controversy over what they are. Are they really a, a briny water that where the sun is uh, uh, shining on the, on the uh, crater wall, perhaps sublimating a plug in an aquifer and then the water runs down in the uh, crater wall? Some indications are that indeed uh, spectral measurements have said that this is water, but indeed uh, uh, there are potentially uh, many of these uh, that are, could be a loose, loose material that, is, that has uh, once the sun hits it and the water that may be holding it together sublimates, then that material also rolls down the hill. To be able to determine that, a helicopter is really in the perfect position to be able to do that. Swoop down with high resolution imaging, spectral analysis, and even methane detection, you know, because some of these aquifers, which, which if indeed that's what they are, supplying water uh, flowing down these craters may contain life, and signatures of methane would be incredibly important. A lot of the ancient river valleys could be explored, uh, literally going down one of these uh, areas, looking for potentially accumulations, uh, if there was life in these waterways of unusual rock formations, and based on what we may continue to find uh, with um, uh, Percy, in Gale Crater, sorry, in uh, uh, Yezero Crater, interrogating the delta, we may find other areas uh, in, in these rivers that are extremely important. Methane, of course, has been observed on Mars, not only directly uh, from our rovers, but even from our telescopic observations. We see that it peaks in the summer, but we really don't have a great spatial distribution idea on its surface uh, at high resolution uh, that we could do, of course, uh, from helicopters, you know, where, where we can create a pattern going back and forth, uh, looking over, making methane measurements, determining uh, whether there are certain times or even areas where methane is leaking through uh, more so than others. Uh, so these are fabulous opportunities to really uh, use these kind of systems uh, indeed to, uh, to be able to make really critical measurements. And then of course, the ability to explore Mars in a rather unique way, really up close and personal. The ability to look at its terrain, the ability to see features 
we can't see at um, uh, even on the scale of what the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter is that can alert us to the fact that we want to go back. Uh, this, of course, is um, a simulated uh, flight uh, using the Mars Trek system uh, going through Valles Marineris, a slice through it, uh, for which then we can examine the floor in great detail, we can perhaps even tease out what might be uh, important information to tell us if this is uh, an element of plate tectonics or based on the volcanic activity uh, uh, th that created this major valley system on Valles uh, uh, Marineris on Mars. So just spectacular stuff. Well, I'm really out of time. Uh, uh, but I just wanted to give you a few ideas that none of these ideas uh, currently uh, are um, moving towards flight. They're just considerations. They're just thoughts of elements that we can do based on the tremendous success that we have had, of course, with um, uh, ingenuity on Mars. So thank you very much. Thanks, Jim. I think we have a few questions and we'll hand it over to uh, Lara again, or um, I'm not sure, James, who's yeah, doing we'll, the Q&A? We'll do Lara for Jim. Yeah, thank you. Hi, James. My name is Lara. Again, I'm going to ask a couple of questions on behalf of the audience. Sure. Um, so the first question comes from Omar and Omar is asking, uh, hi, James, how has the MOXIE unit worked so far? Do you think we would be able to upscale it for human survival and fuel manufacturing? Well, I think it's been working absolutely spectacular. And, and indeed, you'll hear about that coming up. So I, I don't want to steal uh, Mike's thunder. Um, thank you. The next question is, um, let's see. So the next question comes from Gary. And they're asking, whose idea was, uh, was it to fly a drone on Mars? Or maybe if I can add, if you could just add a little bit about the mission team uh, behind, um, uh, yeah. behind, yeah, behind the uh, uh, Yeah, I was uh, at NASA headquarters and I, I had a unique perspective as to what was going on. But indeed, uh, uh, as we were getting ready to release the announcement for instruments on Perseverance, an international announcement, uh, and of course we selected um, uh, many international instruments uh, to add to it, and that was coming up. Uh, Charles Zalachi called me. Uh, he was the director at uh, uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, good friend of mine. You know, we interacted for many years, and he said his team has come up with a spectacular idea. And of course, he wanted me to fund it. Okay, that was uh, uh, how our conversations typically went. And I said, Charles, what, what's the idea? And he goes, oh, We think we can fly on Mars. I said, that is an absolutely spectacular idea, but you have to propose it, all right? And indeed, uh, JPL did. Now, JPL also used their own internal money to move the whole idea forward, uh, creating uh, uh, some of the information necessary for that proposal to be rated in a, in a way that we could actually select it. And indeed, although uh, our first announcement of the selected instruments did not contain ingenuity, uh, in discussions with uh, the selecting official, who was John Grunsfeld, uh, it was decided we could go ahead and then make that selection and move it forward. And indeed, uh, uh, that uh, really kicked off then an opportunity for me, once it's selected as head of planetary, to begin to fund JPL to continue the development, continue to go through the testing, demonstrating that uh, the helicopter could fly, in addition to, of course, uh, creating the design that would work. Uh, and it, uh, it just, um, uh, you know, my hat's off to JPL for really carving out this new area of investigation that we will reap enormous benefits uh, in, on, in, on the future, in the future. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. This is super fascinating. Uh, we have we have a lot of questions coming in, but I'll throw it to Outspace VR. They have one question for you. All right, VR away. Hello. Mm. Hi. It's great to know that uh, the new technology that we have just uh, bringing new ideas and new inventions. It does. Mm. And there is a quite a desire for scientists all of the in all fields that explore the another planet but we, uh, right now there is a bottleneck for the hardware and and the bringing uh, or labs uh, on the planet and do the steps over there so my question is oh, what's the bottleneck right now in robot technology over there is this hardware that uh, power or another that needs to be improved or the software like machine learning to um, bring the intelligent and, and do the stuff uh, as quickly as possible. So that's my question about yes. how to. Yeah, great question. Improve. Now, because of the tremendous uh, concept of flying on another planet, uh, pioneered by ingenuity, uh, we also have selected uh, a fabulous mission. It's a quadcopter called Dragonfly, and it will fly on and in the atmosphere, rather, of Titan. And Titan is a fabulous moon of uh, Saturn. Uh, it has atmospheric pressure twice that of the Earth's. And uh, indeed, it will uh, do an enormous amount of, uh, of interrogation of the atmosphere and be able to move to many different locations, uh, image and high resolution, et cetera. So what are the limitations in this area? Uh, well, of course, uh, Titan is very different from Mars. And so each and every one of these environments has to be engineered. Uh, uh, such that the system can function uh, and perform, you know, the required science activities that we have selected it to do. And so those are very different challenges. So a Titan is incredibly cold, far colder on the surface and in the atmosphere than Mars is. And then, of course, uh, the atmosphere is much thicker uh, in addition to the fact that um, uh, there will be, uh, you know, humidity in that in the Titan atmosphere. It won't be uh, H2O. It'll be uh, methane and ethane in 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 vapor form, which then actually is uh, transports and literally rains out in the northern and southern hemispheres in the polar regions. So those environments have to be engineered, and they're both very different and very unique. And so consequently, they pre present themselves very differently in terms of the challenges that have to be overcome. So how the process typically goes is you, you make a decision on what, where you're going to go, how you're going to fly, what you're going to do with those types of capability and mobility, and then begin the process of engineering it. Uh, uh, because there are different distances, you know, more automation may be necessary for Dragonfly than for Ingenuity or even Ingenuity's uh, uh, follow-on missions uh, because of, uh, of, of the large distances. And then the ability that we communicate also helps or hinders the architecture of, of these systems. So all these things have to be re-engineered each and every time with new constraints and pose different problems in all those areas you mentioned. James, thank you. We are uh, out of time. It was delightful to have you and to learn about the future of flying on Mars. Very exciting. <laughs> Take care. Thank well, you. Well, I can't guarantee that's what we'll do, but if those <laughs> ideas stimulate our science community out there, I am delighted. But I think we can do each and every one of those and more. So Agreed. thank you so much for in inviting me to come and talk about the future of flying on the red planet. <laughs> Thanks, James. There'll be future invites. <laughs> All right, next up is Teddy uh, Zanatos, who is the operations lead at JPL for the uh, Ingenuity Mars Helicopter Program. Uh, Teddy, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me okay? 
We can. Thank you. All right. Let me uh, share a screen here. Okay. Can you guys see my screen okay? Yes, looks good. Fantastic. All right. Thank you all for dialing in and thank you, uh, uh, James, for such a great uh, intro leading into Ingenuity. Um, and uh, again, uh, great to talk to you all today. Uh, my name is Ted Zanetas. I'm the Ingenuity team lead. And I'm going to give you guys a brief summary of what we, we've been able to accomplish over the last six months and what's coming up next uh, for, for Ingenuity on, on the surface coming out of conjunction. First off, none of this would have been possible without our amazing team. We have a, we have a relatively small team that's been working on Ingenuity for, for almost half a decade now, uh, spanning three NASA centers. So, of course, JPL Caltech, uh, Ames Research Center, Langley Research Center, and our industry partners at AeroVironment, Qualcomm, and Solero. Um, I really mean it when I say, you know, uh, none of this would have happened without this fantastic team. So, so thank you to everyone that, that's worked on this and to everyone on, on the Perseverance team that's worked to help accommodate and integrate Ingenuity and, and, uh, and operate it for, for the last six months on the surface. Okay, so first uh, I wanted to cover some basic terminology. Hopefully there's, there's a lot of Ingenuity fans in the audience, um, but it's important to get, get some uh, definitions straightened out from the beginning. Um, first off, we are a technology demonstrator, which means Ingenuity's core mission from the beginning was to prove that we can fly on Mars. Um, it does not carry a science payload. It does not have a core science mission fr from its tech demo uh, objectives. Um, if you allow the Star Trek reference, our prime directive was to prove that we can fly on Mars. That's it. Uh, and, and I don't mean it lightly when I say we wanted to have our Wright Brothers moment. Uh, we mean that in every sense of the word. Um, just like 120 years ago, uh, humanity proved that we can fly here on Earth. Uh, the goal was to prove that we can fly on Mars to provide that foundation to the future. Um, and really see that explosion of aerial exploration on Mars uh, in the decades to come. For each one of our flights, we're bringing back a treasure trove of information, a treasure trove of engineering data that future generations are going to rely on when they look back and say, what did Ingenuity do and what do we want to do in the future if we want to carry actual science payloads or, or do different types of exploration? Uh, how can we build on that? Uh, on board, we have a 13 megapixel color imager, a half megapixel black and white imager. Uh, of course, we have an IMU to help us uh, fly around on the surface, uh, laser altimeter. Um, and we're also looking at environmental data. So uh, what is the solar panel situation? How much energy are we generating? What is the, uh, the solar insulation uh, hitting our solar panel? Uh, we have temperature sensors throughout the aircraft. And the most unique data set is actually the flight dynamics, right? Compared to everything else we've sent uh, out into space, this is going to be the first time uh, where we have a flight dynamics data set of an aircraft, a powered, uh, you know, heavier than air uh, aircraft that's behaving autonomously on the surface and comparing and asking the questions, well, what do our models say the aircraft should be doing and how is the aircraft actually performing? And that delta, that, that's, that's the knowledge gained, right? That's the advantage of having your asset on the surface and, and, and actually in operation. Um, and just like Sojourner gave rise to the extremely capable Perseverance rover that we have today, uh, and you know it started its its humble origins as a tech demo, uh, size of a microwave, and now we have uh, large car-sized rovers on Mars. Uh, we share the dream that we want to see fleets of aircraft on Mars one day, uh, either carrying out science missions or helping future uh, potential human explorers, uh, like James was was showing a couple of minutes ago. So can't wait to see that one day. And I'm extremely happy and proud to say that the tech demo is complete. Uh, we could end the slideshow here <laughs> and, and say we've done it, um, but, uh, but it, it is true. Uh, the original technology demonstration mission was a 30 sole operation. And in those 30 souls, the objective was to A, prove that we can fly, and B, try and execute four additional flights than those 30 souls. Um, we succeeded in that, in that dream, in that vision, uh, and, by the end of it, thankfully, uh, because the vehicle was still healthy and because there was still value to be provided and lessons to be learned, uh, NASA decided to continue the Ingenuity mission and transition it from a tech demo, where, like I said, uh, the prime directive was prove we can fly, that's it, to an operations demo, which is what we're currently in. And the goal of our operations demo is to keep pushing the envelope. Um, what else can we learn about flying a helicopter on Mars uh, from a human to aircraft interaction standpoint, how to improve operations, 
Um, but also, what can we do better on the aircraft front? Can we expand our, our distance uh, horizon? Can we fly for longer? Can we increase the capabilities of the aircraft and make it uh, a more valuable tool for the Perseverance team to, uh, to, to, to levy? And that's been the, our mode of operation since May 8th. And over the last six months, we've been trying to uh, keep pushing that edge and, and, and keep improving uh, the quality of, of scouting capabilities that we're able to return for the Perseverance team. So this all started, uh, you know, with launch uh, back in July of 2020. We arrived and, and uh, we hitched a ride uh, under the belly of Perseverance. I went through EDL in February. And on this bottom right image, you can see this is actually visualization. Uh, and this visualization, you'll see, you can see this black uh, container. And, and James is actually showing an image of our debris shield. Um, we were the lowest point <laughs> coming down from EDL. Uh, and, and that debris shield was there to protect us from any, any dust, rocks, pebbles that would be flying around uh, as we went through the sky crane maneuver. During cruise, uh, we were relatively quiet and, and relatively low level in terms of the activities going on with the helicopter. Uh, we have six lithium ion batteries on board, and uh, just like with your cell phone, if you leave it on, a, on, a, on your table for a while, the battery will start to discharge. So once every two weeks, we would do a charge activity uh, in the six and a half month cruise uh, from Earth to Mars. Uh, here's a, an image from Atlo that gives you a, a better idea of how we were packaged and, and stowed in the belly of the rover. We had to be rotated sideways and our legs needed to be folded up across the rotor system. Uh, you can see our solar panel here and our coaxial rotor system. So the two rotors spin uh, opposite from each other and, 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 and that's how you produce lift. We can get into controls if you guys have some questions later. Um, this is the same image James was showing of our debris shield uh, uh, being dropped. Uh, and the rover actually drove over the debris shield uh, when we were ready for deployment um, and brought us to our first, uh, our first home on Mars, what we call Wright Brothers Field. That was a, an area on Mars specifically chosen for its rock density uh, and slopes and, and safety for our first flights on Mars. We wanted to make sure we could pick the, the clearest parking lot, so to speak, uh, in the immediate vicinity of Perseverance to be deployed onto. This is a GIF showing the full sequence uh, animation of the complicated deployment sequence. I do wanna take a moment here and, and uh, congratulate the Perseverance operations team <laughs> for all of the intricate work that had to go into making sure that each one of these firings uh, and deployments worked and the autonomy, especially towards the end of it, uh, worked as planned. Um, it's important to realize that once we were deployed from Perseverance, there's no going back. Uh, we can't reattach the umbilical. We can't go back to the rover for recharging. So we need to be self-sufficient immediately as soon as all four feet touch the ground. Um, and that also, uh, the biggest challenge there is, is being self-sufficient in terms of just thermal survival, right? So as soon as our feet touch the ground, we start draining our battery to warm ourselves uh, constantly throughout a soul. Uh, and there was a lot of uh, challenges that went into making sure that the rover was able to drive off of the helicopter as quickly as possible and as safely as possible. Uh, once all parties involved were, were confident that the helicopter had safely deployed. Um, and there's some interesting papers coming out soon that, that'll detail a little more about this uh, fascinating process and the challenges involved. So please encourage everyone to check those out in a couple of months. Um, but we were finally on the surface. We were finally deployed, uh, healthy and stable, and ready to begin our core mission of proving that we could fly. Um, just like with aircraft here on Earth, there's a lot of pre-flight checks that we had to go through uh, to make sure that the rotor system was healthy and made it th through the journey from Earth uh, uh, over to Mars. Uh, we had to go through a blade release sequence, which you see here on the left side. Uh, we had some mechanisms that were responsible for making sure that the blades didn't move at all uh, throughout the entire journey. So effects of effectively, you know, flexing your wings a little bit and making sure that, that everything's free and ready to move. Uh, we then did a 50 RPM spin test. Uh, again, just progressing uh, further along the spectrum of, of being ready for a flight. Uh, and we got, we got all green across the board. And you might be wondering, okay, we're going through all of these difficulties, all of these challenges. Uh, why, so what, what's the, what's the difficulty with flying on, on Mars? We're good at flying here on Earth. Uh, the, the simple answer is the air density, right? It's 1% the density of Earth's. Uh, and most of the design and engineering challenges boil down or, or, or derive from that. Yes, the gravity is one third 
uh, that of Earth's, but it's still a bad trade overall if you had to pick which planet you'd rather uh, fly on. Um, from that 1% density, and uh, several engineering uh, directives, or you could think of commandments, flow down from that. Given a fixed volume under the rover that we were able to be uh, carved out for us, um, those directives are the following. You want to make sure your blades are as large as possible to catch as much air, uh, as much of that 1% density air as you can. You want to spin those blades very, very fast, um, again, to produce a, enough thrust to, to fly. And you also want to be very, very light. Okay, And that, that in and of itself, staying underneath the 1.8 kilograms, uh, it, it deserves its own talk and its own uh, a paper on the engineering challenges of producing an autonomous, fully self-sufficient aircraft uh, and, and be that light. Um, two other things I'll point out in this image uh, we can talk about later. You'll see our solar panel up top. So we have three strings of 10 stacks of solar cells, and you'll also see our antenna. This whip antenna is our 900 megahertz uh, link back to humanity. Uh, that's how the helicopter talks to the rover. We have a base station on the rover, and that's you can think of that as our man in the middle. So all the data that the rover needs to send to the helicopter goes to the base station forward it over to Ingenuity. And likewise, all of the data, the flight data, engineering data, color imagery, and black and white imagery, that all gets sent back from the helicopter to the base station and back to uh, everyone in the control room. And it all led uh, to this very first flight. Um, in comparison to what we've been able to accomplish recently, uh, it seems like a pretty simple and, and humble beginning of our flight log. Uh, but this really was the moment that the entire team had been waiting for for years to prove for NASA and to prove for humanity that yes, we can do this. Uh, we're not limited to just Earth, we can fly on Mars. Uh, and, and it was a simple three meter pop up, hover for 39 seconds and come back down and land. Um, but this really is the, the shining moment of the entire Ingenuity uh, uh, mission. Um, and everything that followed has built on that, right? And, 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 and we've been trying to get better at flying for further distances, for increased amount of time, for getting better imagery back, not just for ourselves for technology demonstration purposes, but more and more, uh, especially over the last five flights, um, and James showed a couple of, of uh, scouting images that we've been able to take, we want to improve the value of Ingenuity as a tool, as a scouting resource uh, for the Perseverance Science team and the rover planning team. Uh, here's a, a, a one of the happiest moments in my life, and I'm sure in, in, in most everyone's life here uh, in this image was our first flight uh, in our control room. Um, just like with pilots here on Earth, you need to trust your instruments and your gauges. Uh, you might not always be able to look outside the window and see where you're flying or, or how you're doing on your flight path. And that's no different than, uh, than with aircraft on Mars. Uh, the way the deep space network works and the day and the way negotiating data transmissions work is you don't get all your data uh, immediately. Um, sometimes you'll get a trickle of data and you'll just get a little bit at a time. And it was critical that we all decided what would be our metric, what would be our success criteria for that first flight, uh, and what would be the smallest amount of data uh, that was still sufficient to confirm that we flew and we landed uh, successfully. Um, and that was our altimeter. So you see us all freaking out, uh, staring at us. Uh, what looks like a simple plot to most of you uh, was a very meaningful plot, uh, which which our chief pilot decided was the altimeter. And 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 seeing the altimeter report that we had gone three meters up, held, and then came back down after 39 seconds was sufficient to confirm that yes, we've done it. We've flown on Mars, and we're safe on the surface. Uh, here's a zoom in view of that altimeter. Uh, which I, I have framed and I will keep in a, in a special place uh, in my home for the rest of my life. And, and I'm sure the rest of the team feels the same way. Um, this, this plot matched perfectly with what our simulations expectations were. And that's why we were able to confirm, yes, Ingenuity flew. Uh, and not only did we fly, we came back down and landed and, and we survived landing. Uh, shortly after the, the first altimeter readings, we started seeing some images from that flight. Uh, here's, here is one of the uh, coolest uh, uh, mid-flight images of our shadow. So we have a nadir-pointed black and white imager, um, and, and you can see the blades and the feet here very, very clearly, and this rectangle is actually our solar panel, uh, as we did our simple three-meter hover 
uh, for our first flight. You can also see the rover tracks that Perseverance lay, uh, left for us uh, as nice framing features um, as it drove over the helicopter to its safe observing location. Since then, uh, since, since, since that you know, important, critical Wright Brothers flight on Mars, we've stayed busy. Uh, this is our total life in one image um, since our first flight and, and since deployment, since uh, up to Sol 214. Um, there are two paths you see in this map. There's the white path, which is the, the that's the path that Perseverance has taken uh, uh, all along with us. And then the green path is all of our flight paths stitched together that we've followed along uh, Perseverance with. Uh, we started off in this blue box here where we had flights one through three. Uh, flights four through five extended us further down. And then we really started uh, spreading our wings, so to speak, and, and started going for distance and pushing the limits more and more of, of what Ingenuity was capable of. So you can see flight six, seven, eight, and our most daring flight to date was flight nine where we covered 625 meters. Um, and then we really started focusing more on, on what sort of flights could we do uh, that the scientists were, were extremely interested in. Um, so with flight 10, we went to the raised ridges area. Uh, and, and here's where we really got better at understanding and speaking with the scientists on perseverance to understand what, what is considered a win here in terms of scouting. And it's not just find the coolest outcrop. It could also be confirm that this outcrop is not interesting, right? Um, that's still a win for both teams here to, to, to say, if there's no longer a need to dedicate souls and resources towards exploring that hill, great. We, the Perseverance team can then focus on going to a different location. I want to remind everyone, you know, the, the, the whole goal here of Perseverance is to collect samples and prepare those samples to, to come back home. So if there's any, in any way that Ingenuity can help make that process more efficient, through these scouting flights, that's what we're after here in our ops demo. That's what we're looking for. How can we help in any way possible improve that efficiency? And while we're at it, continue to, continue to learn lessons about what it's like to fly on Mars. Uh, flights 11, 12, and the most exciting one, uh, I think from a science perspective, um, or maybe just because it's the most recent uh, success to date is flight 13. And I'll talk a little bit more about flight 13 before we talk about what comes next. Um, in summary, we, we've covered almost 2.9 kilometers total on the surface. Uh, it's a big, uh, big leap forward from our first flight, which covered zero meters horizontally. It was just three meters vertically. And total time flown now is about 24 minutes and 29 seconds. Again, a uh, large explosion from our first 39.1 second uh, uh, flight that we've had. Here is a graphical representation of our life to date. Um, so you can pick your favorite aircraft metric, whether or not it's distance, flight time, velocity, or accumulated distance. And I'll, I'll let you pick which y-axis you want to look at. Um, but instead of spending too much time on each individual segment, I just wanted to comment on the trends here. Uh, on flights one through five, uh, you can see that we really tried on all of these uh, uh, functions here. Uh, progress as much as we could, right? How far can we fly? Let's fly further. Let's fly uh, for a longer period of time. Let's fly faster. Um, and then you can see as we moved into the operations demonstration, right? We still wanted to push those limits, but the focus has started changing, right? It, it, it's not the case that uh, in flight 10 or specifically in flight 13 that the vehicle was performing uh, differently than in the past, but actually we wanted to slow down. So for example, in flight 13 here, you see that velocity, uh, uh, we started flying slower. We wanted to fly slower so that we can capture better imagery. Uh, we covered less distance because we wanted to loiter over a single outcrop. And we're going to continue doing that. And we're excited to, 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 to have these targeted flights in the future um, because that's where we think we can offer the most value to, to the Perseverance team. Um, but also, we, we, we're still learning more. It's not just about uh, fly as far as you can. There are aspects to operations that, that we're trying to, you know, write the book on. No one's ever done this before, and, and, and we're learning lessons about how to capture better scouting images, how to capture better stereo products and three-dimensional images. And we're excited to keep, keep doing that mission. So uh, I'll talk about our most recent flight and then what comes up next, and then I think I'll, I'll save some time if there's any questions. Uh, so on the left-hand side is our orbital view again, just to orient everyone, where we started, how far we've come. 
And in this blue circle, we're zooming in on a specific outcrop called Fayafu. And I apologize if I'm butchering uh, the, the French pronunciation there. Um, our, our flight 13, you can see, took this U path or, uh, where, where we wanted to fly around this outcrop and take a series of color images pointing towards the southwest to get as much resolution as we could uh, on that specific outcrop and fly slowly for that reason. Uh, this this GIF, uh, animated GIF blink gives you a sense for the improvement uh, in resolution and the improvement in scale. Um, what does an aircraft actually provide, right? Because it's, it's a reasonable question. We have satellites orbiting Mars and we have rovers and, and we have landers. Um, why fly an aircraft over an area? Uh, what does it provide in terms of resolution? And what does it provide in terms of scouting capability? Um, so at this higher altitude, you can see uh, the, the increase in resolution. And we zoom in here, you get a much better sense for what aircraft are capable of providing to mission planners uh, versus what orbiters are capable of providing. And it's not just in, in the context of these orbital uh, uh, images. Um, because we know how far away we were from each one of our color images, you can use that data and stitch together a three-dimensional map and actually get stereo matches across your entire imaging set. And that's what, uh, that's what several people have worked on. Uh, here's an example of what that three-dimensional view of this Fayafu outcrop uh, looks like. And this is, in, in my book, one of the coolest uh, uh, data products that have come out of our flights. Being able to zoom in and, and walk through these three-dimensional environment, right, just based off of helicopter imagery, um, I hope it is going to inspire generations to come uh, for aerial exploration um, and flights to come. You know, we, we still want to keep providing this, this valuable resource uh, to the Perseverance team for as long as we can. And we still want to keep learning lessons about flying aircraft on Mars. Okay, so finally, what's next? Um, so after flight 13, uh, we started uh, preparing for the future uh, months ahead of us. Uh, in terms of seasonal load density. So I'll remind everyone that our original technology demonstrator mission was 30 salts, and we've been flying for six months now. While that's ha been happening, Mars has been moving around the sun, and we're moving into sea uh, an, air an area of the season where the density is dropping. Um, the way you account for that with a rotorcraft is uh, as density drops, you need to spin your blades faster. So we're used to spinning. Our target set point for, for our flights thus far has been 2537 RPM. Um, and we need to bump that up to closer to 27, 2800 RPM to account for the seasonal drop in density. So right before conjunction, we did a, a low density rotor checkout, um, which looks similar to what we did in conjunct, uh, sorry, in commissioning, where we stay on the ground and we just spin the blades up to a high RPM, confirm that the system is behaving as expected. There's no mechanical resonances or vibrations. And that was a great success. Um, we then tried uh, doing flight 14. And for those of you following along on the blog on the Mars 2020 website, there's a there's a Ingenuity blog. I please I encourage you all to check it out. And there have been very detailed write-ups of uh, what's gone right, what's gone wrong. Um, you know, post-flight analysis, pre-flight briefings. You can find a lot of great uh, detail uh, month to month about uh, what our plans are there. And there's a great write-up about our flight 14 attempt, first attempt. And what happened is we did a pre-flight check in all, each of our flights. We do a pre-flight check where we flare the blades and we, we go through just a, a checkout to make sure that everything's looking good. Um, unfortunately, the pre-flight checks did not return a thumbs up and the vehicle did what it was supposed to do, uh, which just scrubbed the flight. We've since then looked at the data, performed additional checks. Things are looking uh, good for the vehicle. Uh, and then we went into conjunction. So we've been sitting down on the surface uh, in the same location we were after flight 13. Um, and starting next week, we'll pick up operations again, and we're looking uh, we're looking forward to doing a post conjunction comms check, uh, make sure that the vehicle's healthy and responding, uh, and we'll check out our rotor system again, and then we'll move on to reattempting flight 14, uh, confirm that the vehicle is working in this lower density seasonal environment now, uh, where we're spinning blades faster, and then pick up where we left off. We're excited to continue the scouting mission. Uh, with flight 15 moving forward um, and can't wait to see what comes next. That's all I have for today. Thank you very much for your time and happy to answer any questions if there's any time left. Thanks, Teddy. Hang handing this over to Segar for your Q&A. Hi, Teddy. I hope you can Hi. hear me. Yes. So I have a few questions for you from the audience side. 
and mm-hmm. the first question is how much dust is accumulating on the solar panels and does the flying help with clean that off Sure. So we have not found uh, a trend in our solar panel data to indicate that there's been accumulation of dust on the solar panel. Um, that's not to say that we're certain that there's a self-cleaning effect uh, from flights. It's it's That's an aspect of ongoing analysis that we're doing from flight to flight. Um, coming out of conjunction, actually, this will be a good data point for that uh, since we've been standing still for several weeks. Um, but that's still still ongoing question. Uh, the, I'm happy to say, though, that across our 13 flights, we have not seen any trend in decrease in solar array performance and total number of watt hours we're able to ingest in the battery. Uh, the battery in the solar system, uh, sorry, the battery in the solar panel, rather, are uh, are behaving just as well as they were on, on Sol 43 when we were deployed. Okay, so the next question is, what will be the limiting factor for how long Ingenuity can operate. As we have already mentioned that it has already passed its time there. Yeah, so that's a great w- point to start on. We've already passed the design limit, which was 30 sols. Um, and there are several aspects to that question. There, there is just the mechanical and, and, and assembly aspect to it, where because everything was rated for 30 sols, um, you know, you can, uh, there may be a point at which certain components start aging. And that's something we're tracking from flight to flight. Um, and then there's also the environmental aspect of that question, which is uh, what does Mars have in store for us in terms of solar insulation, in terms of thermals and con- the continuing varying uh, of, uh, variation of density that comes along with that. Um, we're looking ahead uh, several months out and, and thermally things will start getting warmer for us, which is nicer where we are. The thermal insulation will start to drop. So, so we'll start getting less energy. Uh, but overall, those are manageable challenges, right? We can design flights around that. Um, so it, it, it'll, it'll be a combination of just time, right? Just like I said, we were only designed for 30 souls, um, and, and keeping track of each one of our components from our electronics to our actuators, to our, you know, servo mechanisms, and rotor motors. Um, happy to say though, that, you know, there's no immediate sign of aging, but, but we are keeping track of that. Sigar, do you have another question? Yeah, so we have one more question from Paul. So how are those nice color images that uh, you have taken, like the most high in that, and the camera view angle? Uh, so basically he's asking whether the helicopter is able to tilt and take photos at different angles or whether those are stationary. Sure. So, so the camera is stationary within the frame of the helicopter. So it is possible to try and design... Um, uh, flights and time the images when we're changing orientation, right? So, so, so if we're flying forward and then stop, uh, the way you stop on helicopters, you you lean counter to your momentum, right? And timing an image right when that occurs, that is possible. Um, and and we've discussed, you know, the challenges about uh, trying to design that. It's a timing question, right? How well can you time the exact moment where you take the image versus where the vehicle is in its in its trajectory? Um, so th- there's 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 examples of when we tried uh, doing that in prior flights actually to to to, to get those images while we were leaning, but it's a challenge. Uh, it's definitely uh, it's definitely a challenge to attempt that. Um, so doing stationary scouting or horizontal scouting is is definitely the primary means of imaging that that we've been doing. Uh, looks like we have a question from Alt Space VR. Alt Space, go ahead. Yeah, thanks so much. Um... I, I, I understand uh, you're using a processor that's basically from a commercial cell phone of sorts. Uh, and uh, yes. very, um, very simple. And uh, I, I'm curious, um, just how easy is this to maybe replicate and attach to future rovers? Uh, it seems like you could drop one of these from the bottom. Also kind of curious, can we scale it down? We talked a little bit last uh, with Jim about scaling up, but can it be scaled down to be smaller? For, and is there any reason to do that? Sure. Uh, so if I think I understood the, the, the first question, uh, can we have one of these processors on the rover? Uh, we actually do. Uh, so, so the same exact uh, Snapdragon processor uh, that we have, so it's a Qualcomm 801 Snapdragon on the helicopter. Um, we have uh, the exact replica, uh, uh, almost replica of the rest of the avionics, but that same processor is on the helicopter base station, which is attached to the rover. Um, so so that, that is already there. 
Uh, and in terms of future rovers, right, being able to fly these commercial off the shelf, very powerful processors, is definitely an exciting uh, opportunity in, in terms of compute power on Mars, right? Um, th there's, there's always this challenge between producing data and sending the data back to Earth so we can crunch the data here on the ground with, you know, data centers versus can you have that compute resource available uh, to you on the surface and, and try and digest that data? So it's definitely an exciting opportunity. Uh, and then on the, your second question in terms of scaling down. So scaling down, it just becomes uh, harder and harder to fit within your mass margins, and, and, or, or rather to fit uh, a vehicle that's can carry enough energy uh, and, and, and can still fly a meaningful flight, right? You need to ask yourself, we can go smaller, your batteries sh are gonna shrink, everything's gonna shrink. What is the useful mission of a smaller rotorcraft compared to a larger one? So you can scale down, but everything will scale down with you. Uh, and and for, for Ingenuity, right, it was the opposite question. We had a not to exceed volume and we wanted to fill that as much as we could to make the most capable technology demonstrator possible. Thanks, Teddy, we're out of time. I just have to tell you those uh, Ingenuity flights make all of our hearts leap. <laughs> so congratulations. Thank you very much. Brothers moment. And thanks for Thank being you. with Appreciate us. appreciate it. You're welcome. All right, next up for us is Dr. Katie Stack Morgan. Uh, we're going to switch gears here from flying to driving uh, on Mars. And she is the uh, NASA JPL Perseverance Deputy Project Scientist. And she's going to give us a mission update. Katie, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? We can. OK, I'm going to go into presenter. Sorry, let me share first. Okay, hold on one moment. Okay, can you confirm, are you seeing presenter mode or the actual presentation? We, we actually see your PowerPoint notes view, so not the presentation. Okay, how about now? That's perfect, thank you. Great, okay, thank you. Well, thank you so much for the uh, invitation and opportunity to present a mission update here at the uh, Mars Society uh, virtual meeting. Um, <clears throat> happy to share with you what Perseverance has been up to. Uh, you've already heard now uh, two talks about the Ingenuity helicopter and the exciting things that it's been up to. Uh, so I'll share with you what the rover has been doing. Uh, and we're just about to emerge from conjunction as you, you've heard about uh, and are excited to continue our exploration uh, in Jezero Crater. Okay. All right, so I'll just give a, a brief mission status here. So uh, I think as of today, it saw 233 on Mars for Perseverance as well as Ingenuity, and we're preparing to return after solar conjunction. The rover is healthy and all its science instruments are functioning with no significant issues, which is fantastic. We've driven uh, about 2,600 meters as of Sol 209, which was the last time we, we moved. Um, we've acquired three abrasions using the abrading bit on the rover's uh, turret, and I'll, I'll show you images of that. And thus far we have collected and sealed, we, well, we have sealed four sample tubes, uh, which includes two rock cores collected, one atmospheric sample, and we have sealed one witness tube. And I'll talk more about what is currently in the Perseverance sample collection a, bit, a little bit later. And um, as of uh, a couple months ago, we delivered over 1.3 terabytes of mission data uh, to the planetary data system that's now available to the public. Uh, and so we're excited to share the, the mission's data with, with everybody and, and to get everyone's eyes on, on the Perseverance rover data. All right. Uh, as, as many of you know and are familiar with, uh, the Mars 2020 Perseverance rover is part of a notional three mission Mars sample return campaign involving uh, Perseverance as the first leg responsible for collecting samples uh, and handing them off either by leaving a, a depot on the surface of Mars or transferring in some other way. Uh, to the next leg of the mission that may involve a, 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 a lander and, and a fetch rover. Uh, and then those samples would get blasted into a rendezvous with an orbiter that would bring them back to, to Earth. But Perseverance, of course, is the first step here. And so our focus on, on the 2020 mission is to collect the samples and do the best job of documenting the samples that we can. Um, these mission objectives are also probably familiar to you at this point. Uh, but the Mars 2020 mission has four main objectives, including characterization of the geology and habitability of its landing site, uh, seeking signs of ancient life and, and understanding the preservation conditions under which ancient life might have, have been present and exist in the rocks that it explores, 
Uh, those first two objectives feed very naturally into our sample caching and collecting objective. Uh, Perseverance has the ob objective to put together uh, a returnable and scientifically compelling cache of samples for possible future return to Earth. Um, and then as previous rover missions have for Mars, uh, Perseverance is moving forward um, objectives to prepare for human exploration of Mars. And there's some exciting technology demonstrations associated with the rover uh, to advance that objective. Uh, this, is the the, this is the rover itself and the instrument payload on the rover. Uh, Perseverance carries seven science instruments, which include both brand new instruments like the Sherlock and Pixel instruments on the turret of the rover, as well as RIMFAX, our ground penetrating radar, um, and MOXIE, our technology demonstration to produce oxygen from Martian CO2. Um, and other instruments we have are, are based on heritage, primarily from the Curiosity rover instrument payload including MassCam Z with its zoomable panoramic cameras, uh, SuperCam heritage from Curiosity's ChemCam instrument and Meta heritage from Curiosity's REMS uh, weather station. And so this uh, payload is, is uniquely well suited to accomplishing the science objectives of the rover uh, and thus far has been performing uh, brilliantly on the surface of Mars. Uh, but what really would distinguish is Perseverance, of course, from previous rovers is this uh, sample collection, coring and caching uh, component. And Perseverance has the ability to collect 43 total sample tubes, 30 of which, 38 of which are, are capable of, of accepting uh, rock or regolith samples, and five that we have designed to act as witness tubes that we can choose to seal at various points in the mission uh, as a way to record and document the, the kind of state of the interior of the rover in the sample caching system at the time that those tubes are sealed. All right, so I'll talk a little bit about the landing site uh, and, and Perseverance's field site on Mars. Um, Perseverance is exploring Jezero Crater, which is an impact crater on the western rim of the Isidus impact basin, which is one of the largest and oldest impact basins on the surface of Mars. Um, Jezero is very well positioned to tell us about the history of Mars and geologic processes on Mars and that it is bookended very nicely by both this Isidus impact basin as well as the Surge major volcanic activity over there that we think took place around 3.5 to 3.8 billion years. So the deposits that we see in Jezero, uh, in and around Jezero, likely bookended by these two significant geological events um, and uh, deposits that we explore with the rover are likely related to both these events as well as uh, surface sedimentary processes that incurred in between these two major events on Mars. We'll zoom in a bit. Here is, is Jezero seen up close with topography overlaying here. And um, this is where you can see some of the reasons why we chose Jezero at, amongst the many craters on Mars for, for Perseverance's field site. Um, and Jezero contains one of the best preserved ancient delta deposits on Mars. Um, and we think it contains a diversity of habitable environments representing both surface habitable environments as well as subsurface. And really what attracted us to Jezero was the fact that it has conclusive evidence for containing an ancient lake and that it has inlet valleys and out, an outlet valley, suggesting that the, the crater comple completely filled um, and, and that water then spilled out of the crater. Uh, and so Perseverance is focused on exploring the, the deposits of the uh, interior deposits of Jezero Crater uh, including the Jezero Delta that you can see annotated here, providing what we think is a, a 3.5 to 4 billion year window into planetary evolution and, and hopefully habitability on the surface of Mars. So uh, of course, Perseverance landed uh, to great fanfare and very successfully uh, in Jezero Crater on February 18th, 2021, and has been exploring uh, in Jezero since then. Uh, this is a high rise in the color high rise image showing uh, a zoom in to where Perseverance landed and where it's been exploring. So Perseverance landed at Octavia E. Butler landing site. Uh, it's the blue dot right under that, that green square. Um, and shown here in, in a dashed yellow line is the, the strategic path that we have outlined for, for Perseverance in these first the first year of its exploration here in the crater. Um, and while we ultimately intend to go to the Jezero Delta, which you can just see up there in the upper left corner of the image at a point marked three forks just off the front of the Delta, we decided to focus um, this, this first couple of months and, and, and year essentially on the, the geologic units of the crater floor, particularly heading to the south uh, to explore um, this area shown here in green um, as our first exploration campaign. 
And I'll talk through some of the, the things we've seen along the way and, and, and what we think uh, is going on in this, this part of the crater. So here's a zoom in here. You can see Octavia E. Butler landing site there. And this is the rover's actual path that it has traversed since landing. Uh, and Perseverance is shown there in the blue dot. Ingenuity is there in green. And that does represent the current location of, of both Perseverance and Ingenuity. Um, and we've been exploring, uh, we've gone, been going around the crater, these crater floor units. And I'll, I'll flash on a geologic map that the, the Perseverance science team has put together showing that we have been skirting this, what could be a pretty significant geologic contact, con contact within the crater floor units and could represent a significant unconformity or gap in time between deposition of what we call the crater floor fractured one unit um, and then the crater floor fractured rough unit there, CFFR, uh, in, shown there in tan that the rover has been primarily uh, driving over. But just recently, right before conjunction, Perseverance crossed that contact. And I'll, I'll show you some images of, of what these different rock units look like and why we're excited about them. All right, so while we were exploring the crater floor fractured rough, that unit I showed previously in tan, we saw two major types of rocks. Um, a, a, a rock type that we called low relief pavers. You can see that over there on the left, and that's very typical for what these rocks have looked like. They have rounded edges, low relief, and kind of this rubbly uh, surface texture. But over off to the east, uh, in, in rocks we haven't really explored up close yet, we could see that there were these massive high relief blocks and one thing to note here is the, the near complete absence of any kind of internal structure or layering uh, or sedimentary structures like ripples, dunes, cross bedding that can often give us an indication of what the depositional origin of these rocks is. So there's been a bit of a challenge in trying to figure out what, what are these rocks. Uh, but these two images here are very representative of the types of rocks that we have seen thus far with the rover. So um, after, after landing and checkout and, and performing the first couple of helicopter flights that you've heard about, uh, Perseverance headed south to um, a location called Rubion, where we attempted our first abrasion and sample attempt, attempt in the rocks of the crater floor. And, and again, we're interested in these rocks from a sampling perspective because they are one of the major units uh, in Jezero Crater, also possibly amongst the oldest and, and, and youngest uh, units, depending on whether you're in uh, CFF1 or CFFR. Um, and so we, we wanted uh, very much to sample this, this unit and have this be representative of, of the Jezero crater floor. Um, so here was our very first abrasion on Mars. The Perseverance uh, drill has the ability to pick up an abrading bit and we can basically abrade a small patch of the surface. And you can see that here. Um, and, and you can see actually in these bright and dark minerals and, and holes in the rock. That's what, if you can see my mouse, that's what these areas here, these dark areas are actually holes in the rock. And these textures that we saw in the Braden patch weren't necessarily what we expected to see um, from the weathered surfaces of these rocks. So this was a, a very nice and pleasant surprise to see this level of detail and this kind of texture exposed in these abraded patches. Uh, of course, we threw our full instrument payload um, at this abrasion patch, including uh, the Watson camera, the Sherlock and Pixel uh, to get mineralogy and geochemistry and look for organics as well as the SuperCam laser using all of its techniques, SuperCam instrument using all of its techniques to try to better understand the geochemistry and composition of, of this rock, which we hoped would be representative of the crater floor unit in Jezero. And so what we found when we analyzed this rock is that it has a mafic composition similar to that of a, of a typical basalt. Uh, that's not uncommon uh, on Mars. Mars is a basaltic planet and for example, Many of the sedimentary rocks that we have observed in, in Gale Crater with the Curiosity rover also show very similar mafic composition. So the composition alone doesn't necessarily tell you what the rocks are or how they got there. Uh, but we also interestingly saw and observed uh, salt minerals, particularly sulfates, as well as sodium chloride. And so those aren't necessarily uh, minerals that we think are the primary minerals that were there when this rock originally formed. Uh, but represent later alteration of this rock and perhaps substantial interaction of this rock with water. We also observe iron oxides as well as silicates like plagioclase and pyroxene typical of an igneous, igneous composition. We also have some other interesting minerals like apatite and magnesium carbonate that might be able to tell us something important about what the water that was interacting with these rocks was like and, and how habitable that those, those situations might have been. Um, and so the interaction of this rock with water gives us kind of astrobiology uh, excitement 
uh, because anytime you, you have water flowing through rocks, you have the potential to be creating habitable niches within this rock, these rocks. And so they were of, of high uh, priority for us to, to go ahead and sample. Um, so we did attempt to sample, um, but unfortunately we're, we're disappointed uh, when we got the image of the cache cam from the cache cam, which is, is the camera that images down the tube, you can see that there on the upper left and found an empty tube. And, and as it happens, uh, it appears that we uh, pulverized this rock as we attempted to drill it, uh, suggesting that it was actually quite soft. Uh, again, a surprise. We've driven over this rock and not with the rover and not made much of an effect on it. Uh, but we, we ended up uh, not being able to capture a sample but we do actually have a sealed tube containing Martian atmosphere. So we consider this to be our first atmospheric sample, which is one which was an objective that we were planning to accomplish at some point in the mission, but we, we knocked it out uh, quite early. Okay, so after Rubion and, and our um, unexpected first sampling attempt, we decided we wanted to try rocks that were, were a little bit different and perhaps offered a better chance of success at, at drilling. Um, and so rather than being in the very low elevation region, which is where Rubion was, we decided to go up onto a feature called our 2B Ridge. And you can see that they're going off to the west uh, and thought we might have better luck sampling the hard rocks that capped the ridge. So we drove along the ridge. Uh, but as we were driving, we noticed a, a distinct change in the style of the rocks. I had mentioned before that rocks seen early in the mission had no evidence or, or very little evidence for internal structure and layering. But as we drove along our 2B Ridge, we started to see very obvious layering. And this is, these are the kind of, of, of textures within rocks that you start getting you thinking about sedimentary origins um, and, and wind or water deposited rocks um, or, or possible uh, cla volcanoclastic or ash interpretations as well are, are, are other ways to produce layering in rocks. And so those are things that we are starting to think about now that we are seeing uh, more structural and textural information within, within the rocks that Perseverance is seeing. Um, so, as we drove along, we, we eventually were able to ascend onto the ridge at, at a place called uh, Citadel, where we attempted our first pair of samples and successfully acquired our first pair, pair of samples on a rock that we call Rochette. And here you can see it, it in this image from, from the MassCam Z, or actually this is a, a, a HasCam image. Um, and while this block is, is, is separate um, from the outcrop, you can see it's broken off there from the fragment in the back. We think it's representative of, of this kind of broken up, but, but fairly continuous layer of blocks. So while it's not in place itself, it's likely not moved too far from where it was originally deposited. But you can see some key differences with the previous uh, rock that we were unable to sample. It's standing tall, it has uh, sharp facets on it. And indeed we were, we were successful in, in sampling. We acquired an abrasion here as well. And you can again see the light and dark minerals, mineral grains within this rock, as well as this kind of light tone uh, that we think represents some of these alteration minerals precipitating in, in perhaps voids in the rock, as well as the iron oxides that show up there in, in brown. You also might see these uh, purple uh, splotches over here on the, the weathered surface of the rock, and we think that might represent a, a coating of some kind that we haven't yet been able to uh, analyze specifically that coating with an instrument that would tell us exactly what it's made of, but we think, we think that is indeed a coating on the surface of this rock. All right, so if we do a side-by-side -side comparison of, of our first two abrasion patches, you can see over on the left, this was our first rock and the rock we were unable to sample and it's got those holes in it. Uh, the Belgard abrasion does not have those holes. Uh, it also has much straighter, cleaner uh, edges to the abrasion patch. And that gave us uh, good confidence that we would be successful actually in, in sampling this and that the rock seemed to be more coherent um, and, and better held together. Um, I also wanted to show you this really cool uh, image flip um, where in the back we have the Watson image and then the, in grayscale you see the Sherlock ACI image. It's an image that the Sherlock instrument takes uh, with the ability to resolve very, very fine scale texture within these rocks. And this is kind of like what you might expect to see in a thin section of a rock here in, in the lab on earth. Um, and this arrow here is pointing to what could be some rounded grains uh, or kind of semi-rounded grains within this. So we're very much thinking about, you know, are these rocks volcanic? Are they sedimentary? Are they clastic? Are they crystalline? Um, and using the, the fabrics uh, provided in these, these amazing images that we're taking to help us better understand what these rocks are. This is an example of one of the um, uh, element maps that the pixel instrument can make. 
It's an X-ray spectrometer. Um, and here we can kind of color code the distribution of different minerals in the rocks that we look at. And so here in yellow, you can see where Pixel has detected sulfate minerals in this rock. So again, we're, we're starting to build this picture where we have an igneous original composition of, of, of these rocks um, with some fabric suggestive that they could be coarse crystalline igneous rocks like, like lava flow. But in other places we see things that are more suggestive of maybe clastic or sedimentary deposition. Um, but then we have interaction of these rocks with water to form minerals like these sulfates lightly at, at a later stage and perhaps related to groundwater related to the Jezero Crater Lake. So again, these rocks are exciting from an astrobiology per, per perspective in that they might have had very small uh, habitable niches in these rocks and particularly in these, these voids where you had water moving through the rocks and perhaps creating a, a, a small environment that, that could have been suitable uh, for ancient Martian microbes. All right, so we uh, successfully abraded and then we successfully uh, made, a, made a drill hole uh, into this rock. And we're very relieved to find that we had a coherent, cohesive rock sample um, in the drill bit. And we declared success on our first sampling attempt. Um, this sample is now sealed into 266 and is sitting within the body of the rover um, in Perseverance's sample collection. Um, we then follow that up with the acquisition of a pair. Uh, so a, a, a sample acquired very close to that first uh, Montagné sample, we call it Montagnac. Um, and we acquire pairs because we have an idea that we may put down uh, one or more caches uh, on the surface of Mars, um, perhaps one inside Jezero and perhaps one outside Jezero. So in order for each of those caches to be as complete as possible, and for the Mars sample return future missions to be able to make a decision about which cache it makes sense to go pick up, um, we are acquiring paired samples so that we can make sure that each of those caches is as complete as possible. And so we successfully acquired our first sample pair here at the Rochette Rock. So now our uh, sample collection uh, for Perseverance contains the following four samples. Uh, Rubion, which is our first sample attempt that we now consider our atmospheric sample. Then we have the Montagnier and Montagnac samples of these crater floor rocks that we tentatively interpret as uh, volcanic lava flows, but are still considering whether sedimentary interpretations uh, make sense uh, as well. Um, and then we sealed up one of our witness tubes. Um, we call it the bit carousel witness tube. And that was a, a witness tube that was open from the time the rover was in Atlo to the time that we sealed it on the surface of Mars. So able to document basically the, the state of the interior sample caching system all through launch, cruise, landing, and then the first couple of months on the surface of Mars. So where we are well on our way to filling the sample collection uh, for Perseverance and excited to continue our sampling mission. Okay, so I mentioned previously um, this important geologic contact that we might have been uh, skirting around. And so just before conjunction, we had the ability to actually drive and cross that contact going from crater floor fractured rough to crater floor fractured one, uh, here in an outcrop we call SETA. And so I'll show you um, some data from the RIMFAX instrument. Again, this is our ground penetrating radar. And this is just, this, this image really blows my mind. I mean, here we are seeing in the subsurface actual real structure that we can then map to specific rock outcrops at the surface. And so these red arrows do that correlation here. And what we can see is these dipping rocks. Uh, these are dipping to about the south, um, south is to the left here. And so we think that the rocks over in this part of the image uh, in, in this kind of uh, SETA outcrop are dipping and projecting underneath and are thus older than the rocks of our 2B ridge, including the, the rocks that we sampled. And so as we do this traverse, we're going from younger to older rocks and, and essentially going through time here in the history of the crater floor rocks uh, in Jezero. And so this was really neat to be able to link surface surface rocks uh, with subsurface uh, structure. So a really exciting moment, I think, for, for the mission. Um, and so we, we drove out here uh, to this location of the blue dot. And again, right before conjunction, we acquired another abrasion on these rocks. And you might notice that these rocks are, are much lighter toned um, than our previous ones. Um, and again, these rocks are layered and we're still very much in the process of figuring out what these rocks are, but I wanted to show you because this was our, our latest and greatest abrasion patch. Um, here we think the rocks might be more likely to be, be perhaps sedimentary based on some of the textures and the layering that we see uh, in the outcrop. I wanted to talk really briefly 
um, about some of the other exciting observations that Perseverance has collected in addition to our focus on the crater floor. Of course, since landing, Perseverance has been uh, making uh, observations of the Martian atmosphere. And there's been some really neat uh, correlation and coordination amongst our, our instrument suite to observe the modern atmosphere and environment in, on, on, on Mars. And so here you can see on the left, some images of, of dust devils in Jezero, and then the coordinated, uh, sorry, meta um, observations as those dust devils were moving through the scene, um, seen in both the pressure dips, um, as well as solar radiation, and then the wind direction as well. You can kind of do that matching for when we, we thought we saw uh, the dust devils moving through. And then we can do a similar- left, Katie. Okay, thanks. Um, and then we can do a, a same kind of correlation here um, using the SuperCam microphone, um, actually hearing uh, the, the winds and the dust, the gustiness in the crater and then correlating that with the, the weather data. Um, I'll, I've got one more slide here. I just wanted to talk about um, a, our most recent study and our first study to come out from the mission uh, came out in science just uh, two weeks ago. Um, reporting on results from the Jezero Delta observation. So again, most of our focus has been on the crater floor, but we've already been able to make distant observations of the Delta. And what we're seeing are, are beautiful outcrops uh, that tell us about the evolution of the Delta in Jezero over time. And the fact that we think that some of the latest stage deposits were really high energy floods that might not have really been expected or that we didn't necessarily think were there um, from our previous orbiter studies. So we are very much learning new things about the Jezero Delta and about the history of, of water in Jezero Crater and, and on Mars as well. This is also helping focus our future uh, sampling strategy and, and efforts as we look ahead to once we're done with the crater floor and our attention turns toward the Delta. So I'll end here uh, just with the return to our strategic mission path. There we are at the green star, uh, but once we are finished uh, in the, the Seta area and the crater floor, we're gonna zoom around uh, the Seta outcrop, that mint -shaped, out shaped outcrop, and turn our attention to the Delta. And we're very excited to begin that phase of the mission um, sometime around our one year landing anniversary. So with that, hopefully I have a, a, a minute or two to take some questions. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. Hanging, uh, hang on for Q&A. Uh, hi, Katie. I, put, I hope you can hear me. Uh, my name is yes. Sagar and I will be asking you a few questions on the behalf of audience. So the first question which we have is, are there any NASA plans to place a satellite into an L4 or L5 orbit to mitigate the communication blackout during injection? Uh, sorry, could you, could you repeat the last part of the question? I think I heard the first part, but I'm not sure I caught the last part. So the question is, uh, are there any plans to mitigate the communication blackout during injection by placing satellites in L4 or L5 orbits? Oh, okay, yes, thank you. Um, so, so during conjunction, we, uh, the orbiters and the rover can actually talk to us and, and we've been downlinking data uh, from the rover during conjunction. Uh, we just can't talk to, to Mars and to the rovers, um, but we have, we have been able to, 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 to get data and, and we're actually now, we're, we're actually technically back that we haven't started planning and we are uh, 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 seeing the data flow in now um, and Perseverance actually did science observations during conjunction and so um, as those data came down over the past couple of weeks, our scientists were busy um, looking at observations to tell us about how uh, the modern environment changes doing change detection, which is really good for when you're sitting in one place for a long time. Okay, so the next question is from Grant. He's asking regarding rim facts, how far down can it see with this data and what is hope to be learned from it? Data and what yes. are the results which we have collected so far? Yes, great question. So um, how far rim facts can see down into the subsurface depends on what the subsurface is made of um, and, and how well the signal travels through the rocks. But uh, distances or, or, or depths up to 20 meters are, are possible. And really what rim facts can tell us is, is the geologic relationship and context of the rocks at the surface. And sometimes those relationships aren't so obvious at the surface and are better seen projected into the subsurface. And so, for example, like when we, we traversed that important geologic contact, we had a question, you know, which unit was older? And the RIMFACS data conclusively answered that for us as we saw very clear dipping beds of the older unit dipping and projecting underneath the younger unit. And so RIMFACS is particularly good for giving us the geologic context of the rocks that we are looking at at the surface by providing us the subsurface geologic relationships. Thank you, Katie. 
And uh, we'll take one more question, a final one. Has borate been measured in the samples, the samples which we have collected? Oh, sorry, can you, can you say that again? Uh, we have this question from, um, uh, has borate been measured in the samples which you have oh. collected so far? Okay, uh, no, I do not believe that we have observed borate um, yet. And so that is not yet a mineral that we have identified on Mars with Perseverance. Thanks a lot. And uh, we would love if you can stay and you can answer some of the questions uh, in the chat. Thanks a lot for your time. Thanks, Katie. The work you're doing is, is really amazing. And, uh, you know, in, it's really raising our understanding of the planet in a great, great many ways. So thanks for being with us. Okay, next up is Dr. Michael Heck. Um, he is at NASA JPL. He's the principal investigator on the MOXIE mission, and he's gonna give us a project update. Michael, are you there? Hold on one second, uh, Susan, we gotta bring him in. Okay. My mistake. All right, he's coming in right now. Awesome. Michael, can you hear us okay? Okay, I just it just came offering me a choice to unmute and it just offered me a choice to share. So here we go. And hopefully my video is on. Yes, my video is on. All right, so far so good. Happy to be here, very happy to be here. Uh, a lot has happened since I was here last year. So uh, I, I heard Jim, uh, I kindly deferred a question about Moxie to now. I hope I answer it or happy to do it in the Q&A. But you know, the big news is, is like everybody else on Perseverance, we are now on Mars and operating. Uh, and that's very exciting. So I'll just try to give you the briefest of summaries. Since I, again, I talked to you guys last year, probably many people heard it. But here's what we're doing. Uh, when we send people to Mars, uh, this is the last audience I have to tell this, it would the, the straightforward mission, the Holman transfer mission as laid out in the design reference architecture is one where you take advantage of the natural orbits of the planets. You leave, you take six months to get there. And then a year and a half later, 539 days by this diagram. Sorry to interrupt, head on Michael, home. but I think we, we're seeing the wrong screen. We see your email right now. Oh, that's not good at all. Let's try again. Um, I should have shared. Where's uh, let me stop sharing? Yeah, stop. Is there Just anything good in the, the email? Screen. No, it was just the conference schedule, so we're good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I didn't mean to hit the desktop. I meant to hit the PowerPoint, which is what I thought I did. Um, hold on. For just a moment. I need to restart the the PowerPoint. There we go. So Moxie PowerPoint. This should work, and I thought that's what I did. But how's that? We now see your desktop with the PowerPoint in the middle, but the other windows oh, as well. Heck. Let me try one more time. I, I do apologize. No worries. Um, I do this all the time, but it's it's saying it's not the one I clicked. Says it's a PowerPoint window. It's not a screen share window. Um, Are you presenting the PowerPoint right now? Did you hit click the present button on PowerPoint? Yeah, 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 but okay. but I only I'm just doing it in a window. Um, Got it. And the yeah, way Michael, this I think you you may need to, to expand, work, expand just, the window. I'm just sharing. I'm just sharing the app. I'm not sharing the whole Got window. I'll, I'll do it one more time. Um, let me try one more time. But that should share just the the PowerPoint yes. Win window. Yes, looking good now. Okay, I did exactly the same thing. All right. Anyway. Uh, apologies for the delay here and um, go back one more time. Then the idea is to take advantage of the natural orbits and send a uh, cargo mission followed by a human mission. That's the other key aspect. So the way these orbits work, that means that, that when you send your cargo, cargo mission to get ready for human exploration, you take about half a year to get the stuff to Mars and you have about um, a year and a half to wait before the human crew launches from Earth. And you do a few things with that, okay? You, of course, you put in place the key elements of the human base, the habitat, the rovers, 
critically a 25 to 30 kilowatt power plant, assuming about four, a crew of four, and um, an ascent vehicle that will allow that crew to come home, a fully fueled, and by fuel, I mean both fuel and oxidizer, ascent vehicle. The single biggest thing in that whole, that whole package is the propellant, and by far the propellant is dominated by oxygen or oxidizer. So that's about 25 tons worth of stuff. The whole point of this, of this venture is to not have to bring that 25 metric tons of oxygen to Mars when we send our first crews uh, to Mars. And also to take advantage of the fact that if we pre-deploy all this stuff, we've got a 25 to 30 kilowatt power plant that will eventually support the human base, but is doing nothing. Okay, so the idea would be to use that to produce uh, at least oxygen, if not the full propellant package until the human crew is ready to, to head for Mars. Okay, so MOXIE, that's what MOXIE is for. It's a small scale model because we do not have a 25 to 30 kilowatt power plant on Mars right now. We have what we want, but frankly, the scale up in size is not the biggest challenge. There are other bigger challenges. So being able to test the basic technology and show that end to end, we can make this work in situ on Mars without anyone turning the knobs um, is a huge accomplishment and kudos to NASA for recognizing this and investing in doing it today so that we can go to Mars tomorrow. So what does it do? Moxie makes six to 10 grams uh, per hour. Out of, the, out of thin air, as I like to say, because the air is thin, about 1% as thick as earth, and it is made almost entirely out of CO2, which actually means there's you know, 20 times more CO2 in the Mars atmosphere than in Earth's, even though it is so thin. So what all these numbers mean in reality is, if we run for an hour, we'll make enough oxygen for you to breathe for 20 minutes or so. And we're kind of like a small, smallish, a medium-sized tree. Not that Moxie works like a tree, but like a tree, they both take in CO2 and they both put out oxygen, uh, <clears throat> which certainly helps us live on Earth and we expect will help us live on Mars. So I think Katie already showed this. We're sitting down in the belly of the rover with no windows. So while we are fascinated and, and thrilled to be part of this wonderful exploration of Jezero, um, it kind of doesn't matter where we are in terms of MOXIE operating. Very, very briefly, again, this has been done before, just pointing out we start with Mars atmosphere, and which has five to 10 millibar of CO2, depending on time of day and depending on season. We collect it, we compress it, uh, we probably over, over compress it in hindsight. We put more energy into compression than is really needed. We could run at much lower pressures and will in the future. But we feed this feedstock, the CO2 feedstock, into a solid oxide electrolysis system that runs at 800 degrees C in a highly insulated package. That separates out, that separates some, not all, a, a fraction of the CO2 molecules taken in into CO and O and very efficiently separates those two streams. And in one little wrinkle is that we then, if you look at the bottom diagram, we then return part of the tail gas to the front, to the compressor, to make sure we have enough CO in that intake gas to make a reducing environment so we won't oxidize the cathode. And that's a subtlety, but I'll come back to it in a minute. So to get the levels of oxygen production we do, it's not enough to have one cell. Uh, we stack up 10 of them in series, electrically in series, so they're all producing oxygen, and that's how we get up to the 6 to 10 grams per hour. They're separated by these um, uh, formed, centered, so-called interconnects, uh, and that ha those have all the patterned flow fields within them that direct the CO2 and the oxygen uh, coming uh, in the proper directions from these tubes you see at the bottom right. So this is great to have this little stack. And how do we go from this little tiny thing, you know, this big to an instrument this big? Well, to begin with, we have to package it. JPL did a nice job of this. But first thing they had to do was 
to heat it up in an oven to 800 C. And so they built kind of a makeshift oven where the heaters are in the end caps that partially surround it. Then they had to hold it still, but they also had to insulate it so we wouldn't lose all that heat. And those are kind of two competing requirements, but they ended up with a system with a very structurally solid insulation called Min-K and heavy springs, and then fill in the rest with aerogel. So when you're all done, you have uh, the, the little uh, number one, which is the stack, number two, which is the stack assembly or package, number three is the compressor, and number four is just the very beginning of the assembly process. Okay, and just one other, I don't want to get into technical details, but one other wrinkle I'd like to note is that uh, this is challenging and we can break Moxie if we don't run it right from the ground. And the key issue is that <clears throat> what you have on the, on the X axis here is the fraction of CO2 we're converting to, CO, to, to oxygen. And what you have on those red and green and blue lines, depending on our operating temperature, the solid lines tell us the maximum voltage we can go to before we start uh, depositing carbon on our electrodes you can see what that looks like in the upper left. It's not nice. And it's, uh, it's end, game, end, of, uh, end of game as far as operating on Mars is concerned. Uh, if we go too low below the dotted lines, we don't make oxygen at all. And in fact, we can oxidize our cathode. So we must stay in that safe zone. That uh, thing that looks like a TIE fighter there is, is, is our uncertainties, <clears throat> uh, you know, our, an estimate of our uncertainties. And obviously the farther we go to the right, the more oxygen we try to make uh, fr uh, from a the higher percentage we try to convert to oxygen, the tougher this gets. So I'm just defining some of the challenges. And that's, I talked about all that last year. And when we last spoke, you know, ended with this, here is Moxie getting put in the Rover and this note saying Perseverance launched it was a year ago and will land on February 18th, 2021, which is obviously you know, six months in the past, uh, eight months in the past, boy, time flies. Okay, so rest of this talk, I wanna talk about what's happened since then. So first of all, how do we do a run? <clears throat> well, we have a lot of little knobs, but the big knobs we have to turn are the temperature, this 800 degrees C plus or minus that we run, um, the speed of the compressor, how much gas we collect, and the current voltage relationship of this electrolysis cell, we typically control the current, but we actually would like in the future to control the voltage and let the current follow along. Now, as you can see here, let me go back to that slide. We spent two and a half hours just heating the thing up and which leaves us about an hour's worth of power left to actually do stuff, to actually make oxygen. Uh, and the way we, we plan that is we break that hour into segments that have different functions. So there's a reference segment that we always run so we can compare one run to another, no matter what else we're doing. And then the second and third segments that you see here can be doing any kind of experiment uh, we have in mind. And then at the end, you, we do want to reset to the starting conditions just to make sure nothing changed while we are running. And so what do we do on Mars? Well. We get a moxisol every month or two. Uh, it's been a month up until now, more or less. Um, and as I mentioned, we, we take uh, pretty much all the spacecraft power for the day that's available to the payloads. That's about 650 watt hours. Um, you know, it's always take, also takes power to run the rover. And we spend most of that heating up in about an hour running, but we wanna operate in all seasons and times of day, similar issues to what you heard about from on the, on ingenuity where, you know, it's not just the lift that changes, but the density of the air affects MOXIE as does the temperature. And then we run, have a lot of targeted experiments to understand some of the properties of MOXIE. But overall, we also wanna see just how it ages over time. Okay, so uh, just to highlight the atmospheric density issues, um, you know, the, the daily maximum to minimum is a significant difference. The seasonal variations are even more significant. And so if you go to the, to the, the top of that maximum uh, nighttime, uh, the top line is nighttime uh, uh, curve to the bottom of that you know, midday curve, that's almost a factor of two in density. Uh, the, 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 if the air is twice as dense, we take in as twice as much feedstock into MOXIE. So it's a big issue. 
So we plan to run in all these solid circles. And if we can, we plan to run in some of the dotted circles if it works into the mission timeline. And maybe we'll be, for us, we'll be lucky and get a dust storm. For other instruments, maybe not so much excitement, maybe for Meta. So what have we done so far? We did a number of, of checkout runs as we do often in between the main runs where we don't actually make oxygen. We don't even necessarily heat up. But the first production of oxygen was April 20th, the, the, uh, the night of Sol 59, uh, the morning of Sol 60. And we made over five grams of oxygen, which will keep you alive for 10 minutes with a peak production rate of six grams per hour. We ran for the second time on May 12th. Uh, this was more ambitious. Uh, we produced seven grams of oxygen uh, with an eight gram per hour peak. So that was uh, one third more. And for the first time we ran the SuperCam microphone so we could listen to our compressor, which is a key diagnostic. And it took some doing to run the two instruments at once and synchronize them. And then in SAW 100, we said, we're gonna to go to a lower density time of day and a warmer time of day. And we ran midday on that one and we still got eight grams per hour. And we started to do some experiments about how to nail down the purity of the oxygen. Then we ran again and saw 155 at nighttime with the microphone. And this one, we did a very clever experiment to determine, to distinguish the resistance, the electrical resistance across the stack from other electrical resistances in series, such as over the wires and over the contacts. And that's critically important for us. And our final, our fifth run was just recently on August 17th, where we did another targeted experiment to help determine the purity. So those were our five oxygen runs. And I wish I had like a great video to show you a cloud of oxygen <laughs> coming out of Moxie, but you can't see oxygen, so I can't do that. Um, so basically, this is what it looks like if we say how much oxygen have we made as the time goes along. We warm up for 150 minutes and cumulatively it goes up a ramp. The reason for the wiggle is we kind of pause to do something else uh, as part of that sequence. And that's what it looks like, 623 watt hours. Um, we acquired current voltage relationship curves and we found the best time to do this is not by taking a nice step and waiting and taking a nice step and waiting but watch what's happening while it's doing that nice step. And it goes through all of these current voltage points. And we got very, very nice current voltage relationships, which is key to understanding an electrolysis cell. Uh, we looked at robustness and the, the, the most brutal thing we can do to these stacks is to heat them up to 800 degrees centigrade and then cool them down again, and then heat them up again. Um, and something you really wouldn't do if you had an operating system. And so we keep track of how much the cell resistance changes from run to run. We have some experience with an engineering model at the top uh, showing it's fairly large. And the flight model we sent, we really thought we had this nailed and we did that while you see some increases, they're very, very tiny. We could do a hundred runs like this and still be able to meet all our requirements afterwards, assuming that this slow rate of increase continues. And just to be clear what we're measuring here, the bottom, uh, the x-axis is showing operational cycles. The first one on Mars was, um, was number nine, um, yeah, nine, nine, 10, 11, 12, and 13 were the five on Mars. <clears throat> the previous ones were on Earth. And this IASR is the resistance I was measuring. The full acronym is intrinsic area specific resistance. So we are able to track our robustness and our cycle to cycle degradation, we have some preliminary numbers on purity. And basically, as long as we keep uh, overpressure on the oxygen side, the anode, we can't measure any impurity. If we intentionally put an overpressure on the carbon dioxide side to see if we can force any CO2 into the oxygen stream, yeah, we can force a little bit in, enough to measure, but over any you know, plausible range of operation, you know, up to a 15% overpressure on the on the uh, on that side we get um, oh it's bigger than 15% it's 0.15 out of about about half a bar so maybe 30% we still meet our 98% purity requirement so there we go um, 
That works. We did some focused experiments. I mentioned, for example, where you step the temperature from 780, or in this case, 790 to 800 to 805 um, and measure the voltage. And that tells us something about the, the, the series resistance that I mentioned. And this very cool experiment, I won't try to play any microphone recordings, but I'm showing you a spectrogram, which is to show the frequency spectrum uh, in each vertical line is a, is a time slice. And you can see it, that the points at which we change the compressor frequency, this whole pattern of dark lines, which are our, the frequencies we're exciting changes. And we can measure with this microphone up to 20 harmonics of the, the speed at which the, the compressor motor is turning and see them change. In fact, this turns out to be a more accurate way to measure the compressor speed than the thing that's supposed to measure the compressor speed. Uh, so we're really happy with this diagnostic. And if anything should go wrong in the future, this will really help us debug what's happening. So thanks to the SuperCam team. And I'm gonna conclude, because I would like time for questions um, uh, with, uh, I have a few slides with a couple of you know, uh, uh, conclusions, but just we're not ignoring going to this full scale system. Our partners at Oxion Energy out in Salt Lake City have already developed the stack on the lower, the, 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 you see a pictures of on the right. The top is a, is, a, is a conceptual drawing. The bottom is the real thing that will produce on the order of a kilogram per hour. And a few of those will get our two to three kilograms an hour target that we'll need for the next gen system if we have our power system. Um, Air Squared, which is the company that developed the compressor, is working on a scaled up version of the compressor. At MIT, we're looking, for, looking at what is also a big you know, mass and volume con uh, contribution to that system, which is the filters. We're looking how to make those smaller and lighter. We're also working with a local company, BlazeTech, um, in helping them test their electrostatic dust separator. So we know enough about this full scale system now to know that it will weigh about a ton. It will use about 25 kilowatts of power and over the course of a year will produce um, you know, 25 tons or more of oxygen, which is sufficient to get the crew of four off the planet and on their way home. So lesson learned, well, what was stunning about this is, is we couldn't distinguish operation on Mars from operation in the lab, which is really what we hoped for. And that said, you know, so it's working fantastically. I'm trying to remember the word Jim Green used, but I heartily agree with him. It's sensational, I think he said. Uh, that said, it's a complex system. The devil's in the details and we work very, very hard to make sure we get those details right. And sometimes we need to be extraordinarily clever to do things on Mars that we could do in, you know, in half an hour in the lab. Um, but that's the nature of working remotely. And Finally, the path to the full-scale system is clear, if not without challenges. Uh, and I note in particular, making it produce 200 times more oxygen is the easy part. It needs to be smarter, it needs to be more robust, and it needs to be able to operate continuously for over a year. Those are likely to be the hard parts. So with that, I mean, I, I can't write, even begin to write down all the people who contributed to this. This gives you an idea of the people active in this phase, dozens more at JPL and the development team I didn't list, as well as the staff at our key contractors, Oxion and Air Squared. Um, pandemic, well, this was our last in-person science team meeting in November 20, 2016, and you know, not everybody can travel, so it's a, it's a, this is a group of about 20 something here. And I'm happy to report that we got back together again last week in Copenhagen. And there were only 10 of us, the rest of us were on Zoom, but it really felt like we're back in business again as a team. And um, as you can see, comparing the two pictures, we're still eating and drinking and enjoying ourselves. So with that, thanks to all the partners, thanks in particular to NASA for getting three directorates together, Human Exploration Directorate, the Space Technology Directorate, and the Science Directorate to make this one enabling experiment uh, possible and to take a giant step toward sending, who knows, maybe my grandchildren to Mars. Thanks very much. Happy to field questions. Thanks, Michael. Handing over to Lara for Q&A. You bet. All right. Um...
Hi, Michael. My name is Lara. Can I ask a couple hey, of questions on behalf of the audience? And the first question we got um, is from Carol Stoker. And they're asking a really great question about not so much about Mars, but about going back to Earth and the Earth. And the question is, can a MOXIE-like system be used to, uh, to do direct air capture of CO2 and Earth to fight climate change? Uh, thanks, Carol. Um, I would say no. I'm sorry to say no. It's, the most, it's a very common question we get asked quite a bit. There are better ways to do carbon capture. We're, we're not particularly good about that. Where MOXIE might come in, it might, is once you've captured carbon dioxide from the air, um, you need to do something with it. And part of the reason I say we're not good at carbon capture is what we do to it is really energy intensive. We have to, we tear apart the CO2 molecules and, and, and turn it into oxygen. And then we still have to do something with the CO. Uh, if we, otherwise it will just turn right back into CO2. So that would take even more energy. Um, so it is one way to convert that captured CO2 into something that we can use like more oxygen. But I suspect it's not the most efficient way because it does involve tearing molecules apart. And I think biological systems probably from a system perspective are a more effective way to, to mitigate, you know, to deal with carbon, with recycling CO2 back into something useful. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Well, the next question is, um, what other gases would MOXIE be able to produce with a few changes? Ah, well, of course, one thing to remember, or, or just to make clear, I should make clear, is MOXIE is essentially a fuel cell, okay? And fuel cells can run in either direction, just depending on you know, whether you put positive voltage or negative voltage. So the fuel cell reaction from MOXIE would be you know, you put in carbon monoxide and oxygen as your fuel and oxidizer, you get out oxygen, you get out CO2, you get out electricity. And I'm saying that because kind of anything you can do with a fuel cell, you can run backwards. Uh, the big one on Mars would be to do electrolysis of water at the same time. And typically you do that in the same system, you do co, you know, co-electrolysis. So you put in water and CO2, kind of like, now it's kind of more like a tree and uh, you know, a tree will do that and get carbohydrates out. Um, but what we get out was it would be a fuel or, you know, maybe methane or maybe paraffin and oxygen by running those two together. And there are other technologies for doing uh, water electrolysis, but this is a very competitive one that is being pursued. Um, you know, the only gas in substantial quantity around on Mars is CO2, and then you can find water. So, while there are many more things you could do with this technology, I think those are the two big ones. Thank you for the answer. And sure. the next question is, do you know if SpaceX is planning to include MOXIE into the Starship design? Hey, if you can find out, please tell me. <laughs> okay, I'd love to know. Uh, they've talked about it. I, it's not my understanding that they have done much more than thought about it at a system level and how it fits into their system design. And that's critical. But I don't think there's been any real technology development, but I honestly don't have the insight to know. All right. Um, next question. Uh, will future iterations of MOXIE have a technology demonstrator to make fuel in Mars? In other words, will we do this again with the next generation? I, you know, I can't speak for NASA. Maybe that's a question for, I'll toss, should toss back to Jim Green. But I'll tell you, my opinion is that I doubt it, uh, be only because there are so many technologies. We ought to be testing on Mars before we trust our astronauts' lives to them. And I think MOXIE has, the, the MOXIE technology has had its turn. And next time we do this, something else will rise to the top as being the key one to demonstrate. That may be the liquefaction, the liquefaction of the oxygen and trying to demonstrate a long lived, um, uh, you know, oxygen, no loss storage system, for example. Thank you. And I guess we have um, time for one more question. And Great. this is a question from Amit and they ask, can compression provide some heating and can a future design have a solar oven? Wait, I'm sorry, can compression provide heating? And what was the second heating. part? And can a future design have a solar oven? 
Oh, a smaller oven? No, we actually don't want a smaller oven. We want a bigger oven. Um, um, no, not not a smaller, but a solar. So, I, a solar, a solar oven. I'm not. Oh, solar, S -O -L solar, solar. Yeah, solar. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> the oven is not the main consumer of power. Uh, well, right now it's the compressor, but in a future system, you know, that would be the actual electrochemical energy we need to provide. And we need 25 to 30 kilowatts. So for sure, um, you can do 25 to kilo, 30 kilowatts with solar and batteries. I don't believe that's the way NASA is going. And it looks like the directions for at least the US, you know, the NASA space system will look to nuclear and not to solar to, to provide that power system for the human mission. But again, I refer to NASA for the definitive answer to that. Thanks, Michael. We are out of time, but uh, really, thank you very much for the important work you're doing with MOXIE. Can't be understated at all. No, <laughs> sorry for, for frittering us. away a couple of minutes at the beginning, <laughs> messing with, with sharing, but Perfectly thank you so much for the, oppor for the opportunity. Thank you for being with us. Bye. All right, our next speaker is um, Mars Society Royalty. She's one of my favorite Martians. Um, Dr. Penny Boston, and she is affiliated with NASA Ames. She's a scientist at NASA Ames Research Center, and um, she's going to talk to us about astrobiology, uh, and the title of her work is Astrobiology by Any Other Name, The Search for Universal Indicators of Life. Penny, are you there? I'm here. Hopefully you welcome. me. We Thank can. you. Thank you. Uh, performing the ever-delicate screen-sharing maneuver here. <laughs> making sure I get the right one. <laughs> All right, hopefully you can see my screen. And we'll go to that. All right, hopefully everything is okay. Um, Looks perfect. Very, very happy to be with uh, everybody at this, uh, at this meeting this time. Uh, the last number of years I've been unavailable uh, for uh, just about every Mars Society meeting because of the time that it was being held. Um, this is a, a talk that actually I developed a, a more full-blown version uh, for, uh, for the American Geophysical Union Conference uh, in uh, December of 2019, just before we started to experience microbiology at the viral level in all its many manifestations. So what I've done is revised that uh, in light of you know, the last couple of years and compressed it, uh, taken out some boring graphs and stuff. And I wanna talk uh, really sort of beyond the Mars scope. Um, as I have thought about astrobiology, of course, starting with my interest in Mars many decades ago, um, it's become more and more clear to me that as we're moving out into uh, not only our own solar system, but uh, also beyond uh, to look at uh, potential life process indicators on exoplanets, that really we're looking at the whole solar system scale. So a solar system is either a life-bearing or a not life-bearing solar system. And we know that we are a life-bearing solar system insofar as we have at least one planet, uh, ours, uh, that can do this, but trying to generalize how we go about looking for signatures of life. Um, how do we expand our uh, scope of thinking so that we don't miss signals because it's very different from our kind of life. So I think most people in this uh, well acquainted audience will know that astrobiology is a gamish of uh, of all the different uh, fundamental sciences, along with a, uh, a whole load of various different kinds of engineering in order to enable us to actually get somewhere uh, to study various uh, planets in our solar system and ultimately beyond. There is a long history really of, um, of even contemplating this. And I wanna point out a couple of different points at which uh, I think significant advances were made in our thinking. And one was really one that hasn't been as much celebrated as some. Uh, this occurred in the, in the 40s and the 50s. Um, uh, a Russian named uh, Gavril uh, Tikhov 
actually sort of rounded up a bunch of enthusiastic young gra graduate students, <laughs> which is a pattern that has been repeated in many other uh, kinds of episodes of study of, of these, these kinds of topics. And they spent their time looking at the optical characteristics of terrestrial plants and thinking about uh, the you know, extreme environments that they had uh, access to and going up there and trying to figure out how these difficult conditions could actually affect what the optical specter of plants would be, uh, clearly with an eye to uh, figuring out how we would go about looking for life. These themes, of course, have been then woven through uh, the decades since. And uh, you know, one notable study, uh, Seeger et al. in 2005, looking at the vegetation red edge, which would be a possible spectral feature that could indicate some kind of uh, uh, biosignature for an extra uh, terrestrial planet. So these themes have cropped up over and over again. Uh, the term exobiology, which um, we still use within NASA for uh, one of our programs, uh, was originated in the late 1950s by a Nobel laureate, uh, Joshua Lederberg, uh, who should have shared the Nobel Prize with his wife, Esther Lederberg, but did not. Um, and then, of course, other names for this study uh, have cropped up. Uh, if you have never read The Star Beast by Robert Heinlein, which is an early 1950s book. Uh, it's actually a pretty good book and it's not as dated as you might think. Even Winston Churchill in 1939 wrote an essay on uh, alien life and are we alone in space? So you can see that these ideas of course have been floating around and modeled and remodeled and remodeled until the point at which in this space age that we find ourselves, we actually have been capable for the last uh, number of decades of actually doing the rigorous scientific work or hopefully rigorous scientific work to actually go in the direction of uh, trying to figure out how to look for other life, how to understand it, how to characterize it. Uh, will we find it in our own solar system? Uh, will we only find it in other solar systems at great distance? We start by trying to know about life on earth, uh, the biology that we have here and understand the conditions on other planets, both here and, and elsewhere in the galaxy. And then we try to map the life stuff onto the planet stuff. And that explodes in a profusion of questions and um, approaches. And so astrobiology is a stunningly broad set of potential studies that cut across all of the fundamental sciences from physics to, as, uh, to biology, um, perhaps AI, ML, in order to facilitate some of our, uh, our, our investigations and so forth. So on Earth, we know that we have really obvious biosignatures. And you can see on the left of the screen, that's one heck of a big dinosaur bone. And um, so that for us in our earthly context, understanding Earth biology as we do is an obvious biosignature. On the right is an image from the Mars Desert Research Hab uh, environs uh, from our 2002 expedition, which was Crew 6 that I participated in. And that red stuff, uh, an iron compound that is on some of the fractures in some of the rocks there is a very not so obvious biosignature. And it took years to really uh, characterize that, uh, show that there were entombed uh, microorganisms that uh, contained some signature material that showed that they were iron oxidizers and so forth. So uh, on the very large scale, if we go elsewhere and we find big dinosaurs, uh, we're very well prepared. On the small scale, it's more subtle and harder. So I'm not gonna go through the details of this slide, but I always take an opportunity to show one of my favorite images from Joel Hagen that he, uh, that he uh, uh, created many years ago. Uh, but so we have the life produced gases like we do on earth, um, we have biological molecules and in our planet, these are sort of gooey organic things. Um, and then we have morphology uh, with all sorts of different examples in there that I've thrown in there. But the point is really the main categories. Um, when we look at our planet and we look at the spectra uh, of the different gases in our atmosphere, we see uh, in the top of this, this graph, we have all of these split out by methane, carbon dioxide, water, et cetera. When you come 
uh, when you smush all those together, you get this tremendously uh, complicated um, uh, spectrum that you see on the very uh, lowest insert there. And so this is our great hope for exoplanet studies uh, to try to look for life that is chemically and perhaps uh, um, similar to us in its environment and in its manifestation of activities on its, on its atmosphere. At the small scale, the kind of work that I've done for the last number of uh, decades is um, the microbial effect on a rocky terrestrial planet, even one with water. And I'm not gonna go into any description of any of these things. I just wanna dazzle you with the eye candy uh, that on earth microbes are manipulating the basic materials of our planet. It's basic rocks and minerals um, using fluids and using gases and emitting gases. And these processes produce a wide variety of even macroscopically eyeball scale uh, visible patterns, textures, and mineral compositions. Sometimes on Earth, we have come up against things that look like they might have been biology at one time, but when we investigate them, uh, like these examples here, we can often find no other evidence, not um, isotopic evidence or chemical, uh, geochemical evidence or biochemical evidence or DNA or any of those things. And so we're left only with the morphology. But because we have the opportunity on our planet to study a lot of very different environments, we, the community, are beginning to you know, piece together uh, what is the Rosetta Stone of trying to understand uh, material even when it's only gross morphology and, no, and has no other uh, signals in it. One of the revolutionary ideas in the last um, decade or so uh, was brought to life by uh, Bob Hazen and his colleagues, first published really in 2008 as a full description. Uh, the crux of this is to argue that the vast array of known minerals that we have on Earth today, and more are being um, uh, discovered all the time, actually are a biosignature. And uh, they base this notion in the fact that there are essentially 12 primitive mil minerals in the early solar system. That's what we see in primitive bodies that we're studying. Uh, and we're making great strides in, in uh, studying those. The Lucy mission is uh, about to launch in a couple of days. Very excited about that. Um, but 4,400 known minerals uh, at the time that they, that they published this work, they attributed about 1,500 of those or less than half uh, to the presence of the liquid water that we have and the fact that we have a planet that conducts tectonic um, activity. And then they attributed the rest due to life. At this point, um, that gives us another potential key in looking at other planets in our solar system. Will we ever be able to tell about the mineralogy of exoplanets to the fine detail that it would require to, uh, to interpret um, that as a biosignature, I think we're not close to that yet. Um, but nevertheless, this is a revolutionary idea in my view uh, that gives us a whole other realm of biosignatures to investigate here on Earth and in our solar system. So crystal biosignatures um, are very common in rocky environments in, on our planet. Um, microorganisms of many, many, many different kinds manipulate uh, elements, they um, break down rocky materials, they reconstitute them in various forms. Some of the most striking ones I show here, uh, the lower left image is uh, from a natural sample from the environment. And the two images on the right are some of our experiments uh, reproducing some of these crystals in culture with microorganisms that we've isolated from these environments. We often have elaborate living morphologies that we can see at the scanning electron microscopy scale, as you see here. And these range from the lower left, uh, which is a very biological form, and those uh, forms turn out to be clearly uh, very active, alive microorganisms that produce all sorts of uh, other data that we can um, detect them by. The upper left shows a remnant that is almost entirely um, coated in minerals. So these are no longer active microorganisms and yet they still have uh, organic material in them that's quite 
uh, analyzable. And then the two images on the right are an enduring mystery that I'll talk about very briefly in a couple minutes. Uh, these forms we are finding in many, many different subsurface environments around the world. I've been talking about them for almost 25 years, and we still don't know what they are. So uh, they're my uh, on earth paradigm for uh, the difficulty of using morphology to understand what we're seeing on other planets. A few other examples here just to tantalize you. Um, the upper left shows cute little fuzzy guys that are happily alive, but the upper right shows an entirely iron oxide um, coated remnant of life. The scale at which we want to actually attack these problems is something that I think is coming into its own as we are gaining traction with um, advances in artificial intelligence and machine learning and morphology and pattern recognition. So in order to interpret an environment like this uh, on earth with these giant crystals that we've been studying in uh, the NICA system in Mexico for over a decade, we see these big giant crystals. And then at the smaller scale, we see sort of rough surface textures at the finger scale that you can see in the lower left. And then when we actually interrogate this with high powered um, electron microscopy, we can see all these fine thread-like uh, structures here. And if you put all those together, you begin to see a pattern of everything from the small scale biology all the way up to what it is doing to the geological environment in which it is uh, finding itself. I think that this kind of investigation is something that our robotic uh, capabilities will be able to interrogate uh, within perhaps the next decade or, or so. Um, I wanna just say two words about extremophiles. We kind of fling that idea around all the time. Uh, at some level, people almost act like all extremophiles can tolerate everything. And we do have one organism that seems almost like that's true. And those are the um, tardigrades, the little water bears. Um, but the truth is that even though we've been studying extremophiles since the late 1960s, uh, what we don't know about them is probably most of the story. So we don't really know what the minimum water activity that they can tolerate is. Uh, the scale is from zero to one, and we think maybe it's 0.6. Uh, but there are some organisms that have been suggested to be using water vapor directly. It's very hard to study that. I think that's an open question. One of the things that uh, you can derive from a couple of the pictures that I've just shown you from my work uh, of these fantastic uh, shapes of some of these microorganisms. What are they doing? These guys are living on a really tough diet. They are eating salad and not chocolate cake. So there must be some reason that they're actually making fuzzy things and um, complicated surfaces and so forth. What is that doing on the microphysics surface level? We really don't have an idea. Um, and then there are multiple tolerances that organisms may have that are synergistic. So uh, the well-known uh, organisms that are uh, highly ionizing radiation tolerant, uh, it appears that they actually um, benefit from the fact that they were actually trying to become salt tolerant and um, that also conferred radiation resistance. So, um, the, the interaction of these complexities is something that we're just being able to scratch uh, the surface of. But all of that said, everything I've shown you is from an earthly um, perspective because that's what we have available to study at the time. How universal can these uh, indicators possibly be? Well, I think that as we advance into the rest of this century, um, it's not just Mars, our, our favorite planet in this group, uh, but it's also all these other bodies. And all of these bodies are under consideration. Some have missions that are already um, you know, approved. Some are in the planning process. Uh, undoubtedly, we will go to these many times over the next um, 80 or so years, the re remainder of this, of this century. And I have uh, well over a decade ago, sort of divided planets in my own mind into type one and type two. And type one, we have only one example and that's us. And this is where the biology on the surface is uh, extremely conspicuous. The atmosphere is conspicuously complicated um, as, um, 
you know, as a consequence of these living processes, there's many other factors here, but all of the other potential bodies in our solar system, if they house life at all, have to be put in my planet type two biosphere category, where they have no visible, obvious uh, means of support on the surface. Um, the, the gases, if any, in an atmosphere or in uh, what we would consider chemical equilibrium. And this would mean that uh, many of them are in the outer solar system, like the icy moons. This would mean that energy, or at least a large part of the energy, would come from chemical geological sources on the interior of the planet. This makes the whole planet uh, type two biosphere category rather cryptic. So where do we go from here? Um, well, I always talk to my cats about this and they always have good ideas. Um, Astrobiology as a field is advancing very rapidly in many ways. And some of those ways that we're advancing rapidly is really incredibly refined ability to um, investigate um, the chemistry of the environment, the chemistry of living things, the geochemistry and the biochemistry and how they overlap. Um, there are many other areas though that are uh, much more difficult to do and as we contemplate future space missions, how do we use the uh, wonderful devices that we currently have, but also add to those so that we have a broader spectrum of different data types. I think I'm going to skip over everything except a couple uh, of lines here. Based on you know, my work for 30 plus years in the subsurface, looking at organisms that mostly eat rock and poop out other minerals, uh, there are many unifying themes that don't depend necessarily on the chemistry. And this is a list of some of them. Um, we have very large biodiversity. Um, they grow very slowly. They make um, patterns. They tend to fossilize themselves in place. And so all of these are potentially signals uh, that may not depend on the chemistry. I want to say one word about biopatterning, these patterns that you see, these complex hieroglyphics patterns. Uh, we believe that we have seen them in so many different environments at so many different scales on planet Earth that we think that they are actually a reflection of basic survival strategies, not the resources that the organisms are going after, but the way that they go after them and it produces these patterns. Maybe something like this could be a, a biological uh, signal. I want time for um, questions, so I'm just gonna finish with this one last slide. Uh, a lot of the upshot that I think matters for Mars is based on our observations of the fact that apparently microorganisms seem to be able to survive in geological environments on Earth, particularly buried ones or subsurface ones for very long periods of time. This has led us to speculate whether or not the subsurface could act on Earth as a, a geological genome bank where organisms get buried or trapped, uh, essentially still viable or some small portion of them is still viable over geological time. And then they can be reintroduced um, as geological changes on the planet um, re, uh, allow reemergence of these organisms. I think this has particular uh, potential application for Mars. If Mars, does have a remnant subsurface biosphere still, then it is a different case from Earth because it is no longer experiencing the tremendous amount of geological change that Earth has experienced. And so that would mean that such a subsurface system would have been um, uh, sealed away largely from the surface for a very long period of time. We don't know that. And so this is one of the drivers that I hope to live for a very long time so that I can see how things turn out. And uh, just ending with one of my favorite uh, uh, comics by Nathan Pyle in his Strange Planet series, sometimes science is so difficult it makes me sad, but very often science is so wonderful that it makes me happy. So thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, Benny. Um, wonderful presentation, super fascinating. And the, especially the pictures, the macro ones are just wonderful. Um, so I'll ask you a couple of questions on behalf of the audience. 
Sure. And the first question is from Daniela, and they're saying, Origin of life is fascinating. The adaptation ability of bacteria in new extreme environments would show us the new ways how to look for life. Are you planning to look for bacteria which was brought on Mars or Moon via contamination by vehicles and such and learn? I think contamination of planets is a risk, but also is a gain. You know, the, the planetary protection issues are very sensitive and um, very complex. So as we are trying to investigate Mars and other planets for the presence of native life, um, we don't want to screw ourselves up by making it very hard to tell if what we are looking at when we bring samples home to Earth or when we uh, eventually have people on Mars looking at uh, samples there, we don't want to confuse the issue with contamination. That said, humans need uh, our microbes. <laughs> we need them inside and outside of us. And so we have to take our bioflora with us. And so um, the presence of humans will contaminate at least the area around human habitats. I think that it's very interesting, the question that you raised in terms of what will happen to those organisms when uh, they get introduced into a circumhuman environment. I think we certainly will be studying that. I think we're already sort of studying that um, by all of the biological experiments that are going on on the ISS. And that presumably will be able to go on, um, you know, at Gateway and uh, our opportunity to go back to the moon with Artemis to actually make biological investigations there. So we can see how Earth life uh, adapts to the lunar environment and the, uh, and the microgravity environment. Uh, but certainly we will learn a lot more when we study those organisms that we unavoidably take with us. At the same time, of course, we wanna be extremely persnickety about um, making sure that we keep any human associated microbes away, um, particularly in the early days uh, from any potential Martian life samples. And so it's quite a balance. And, um, you know, many committees have written reams and reams and reams about this and continue to do that. And it's of great concern, both to NASA and, um, and globally to the space exploration community. Thank you. The next question comes from Will and they ask, do we expect slower metabolism on the icy planetoids? Would this result in lower doubling rates, mutations, and speciation, or any environmental cases for higher rates of mutation, selection, and diversity? You know, uh, it's so hard to tell. I mean, some people have made the argument that, um, that you can predict clearly whether or not there is enough energy source on a planet, either by incoming solar, um, radiation or internal geological uh, sources of energy that you could predict whether or not you would get life. But when we look at examples on Earth in very, very, very low energy environments, um, organisms seem to be exceeding our expectations in terms of how long they can hang out there. So the simple-minded concept of minimum amount of energy that an organism needs in the past has been based on what it needs to be active over uh, you know, ordinary time. But um, I think we need to extend this idea to organisms for which we have paradigms here on Earth. We know that in very rigorous parts of, of our planet, like the uh, North and South Poles, many organisms spend a lot of their life cycle uh, being inactive. So I think that the answer to that question, which we can't give a, you know, a broad answer to, is going to depend on the exact energy sources and the access of hypothetical organisms on the ocean worlds to those. Certainly the temperatures are quite cold uh, in the regions that we understand, but maybe we would um, understand that there might be spot sources of energy, um, you know, geothermal, hydrothermal, 
vents or something like that. So it's really, um, we're just guessing at this point. Wonderful. Thank you. And the last question, because we've got one minute left. Um, let's see, um, all of them. There's a lot of great questions, but I'll ask the last one, which is um, what statistical probability would you attach personally that life evolved 100% on Earth? Or I guess Why? that the life is the game. Yeah, um, I don't know. I, I think that there is some, some case to be made for at least the plausibility of organisms being uh, lofted from one planet to another within the same solar system. I don't know. I would put that probably in the single digit probability. <laughs> um, you know, further panspermia like across the galaxy or something from one star system to another. I think that's pretty hard to figure that out unless you're dealing with an extremely radically different form of life that really is much less fragile than what our life is made out of. So, you know, are there silicon organisms uh, hitching a ride across the galaxy? I don't know. Uh, in our solar system, I think, you know, we certainly see that rocks are mixing themselves up across our system. So stay tuned, hope to live for 500 years. Okay, it's great to see all you guys. <laughs> Thanks, Penny. Great to see you again. Thanks for being with us. Thanks. All right, our next speaker uh, is the distinguished clinical professor of space leadership, business, and policy at the Lund uh, Thunderbird School of Global Management at Arizona State University. Uh, he also serves as the chair of the safety working group of ComStack, which is the Commercial Space Transportation Advisory Committee. Dr. Greg Autry, pleased to see you, sir. Thank you so much, Susan. Uh, thank you, everybody at the Mars Society for uh, uh, taking the opportunity to allow me to speak. Uh, thank you in particular to uh, Bob Zubrin, who I greatly admire for including a number of different voices uh, in his fine conferences. And uh, I hope to see you all soon in person at the next one. Um, you know, I was going to uh, talk about one thing and, and some events have occurred that uh, have shifted a little bit what I, I intend to talk about. Um, are my slides sharing there now? Yes, sir. You look good. Actually, hold on. There we go. I want to share the window. Okay. So uh, I was going to talk about just space entrepreneurship, um, but I really want to talk about space entrepreneurship. Uh, under attack and uh, make a little bit of a call to action in support of uh, something that I assume most of us here at the uh, conference are, are excited about seeing and supporting. Um, I'd like to say it's the best of times and it's the worst of times. This is the year that a lot of us have been waiting for for a very, very, very long time. Uh, you know, we just we just friggin' watched uh, Captain Kirk go to space uh, and and watch the uh, the overview effect click, and we've been sitting around uh, many of us for a very very long time um, waiting for uh, for this day. And it wasn't just uh, the Blue Origin flight. Of course, it was the uh, Richard Branson Virgin flight uh, this summer, one I've been waiting for for a while. Uh, it was the Inspiration Four flight from SpaceX and uh, we know that a lot more is coming. We're, we're gonna see human space flight from uh, uh, Boeing. Hopefully uh, next year, we're going to uh, see uh, the Orion capsule, uh, hopefully uh, carrying people in a couple of years. Uh, Starship, my gosh, uh, that will, will change the world. Uh, it's a great time to be here. Uh, I've been studying this for a long time. Um, I was on the runway back in 2004 when uh, Spaceship One made the first human Space flight and watched Richard Branson uh, announce that he was going to uh, to form a space tourism company. Uh, the first, I think, really serious uh, attempt at that. Um, there were quite a few efforts in the past, but the, the first time that somebody of real credibility stepped up and committed their credibility to uh, to making it happen. And uh, you know, bless him, he did. Uh, it's been 17 years. If you would have asked me uh, back in 2004 when I took this photo. Uh, when that was going to happen, <laughs> I and the folks in the crowd would have said, oh, it's going to be about three years. And then about five years, you know, we're all going to be flying. Uh, it's uh, 17 years later, uh, but here we are. So 
that's exciting. Uh, I go to Google uh, an image of William Shatner uh, and the Blue Origin capsule for this speech, and this is what I find. The top story on CNN about space is this quote from Prince William. We need some of the world's greatest brains and minds fixed on trying to repair this planet, not trying to find the next place to go and live. Um, that's extremely disappointing to me. Uh, I've been disappointed in his brother for a while. Uh, now, unfortunately, I, I'm disappointed in the, the prince. And, you know, I have to describe myself, frankly, as an Anglophile. Uh, and uh, like a number of Americans, I'm even kind of a fan of the British royal family, uh, a peculiar American trait. And yet, um, you look at all the great things that are happening in, uh, in the UK and space. I had the opportunity uh, uh, to spend a little more than a, a week uh, in the UK uh, about three weeks ago. I was in London and I had the opportunity to speak uh, uh, at Oxford and meet some good friends at Imperial College uh, and speak to a group of Thunderbird uh, alumni, uh, sit on a doctor of philosophy uh, candidates, uh, um, Viva for uh, his cybersecurity uh, uh, and satellites paper. Um, there's a lot of great things happening in the space uh, world in the UK. And you look at these stories, you would think that the leadership of the UK would be uh, wholeheartedly embracing this. And, and the PM is, and a lot of people in parliament get this, but to come back uh, from seeing the opportunities for jobs and economic growth and uh, improving the life of everybody on earth, uh, improving the, the quality of the planet, learning more about our planet and making everybody aware of it and, and, and have this quote show up uh, was devastating. So I, I wanna talk about this because we can't just talk about space entrepreneurship and numbers and say, this is what's happening with satellite launches and this is the number of new rocket companies that are appearing and is there gonna be a, a shakeout and uh, you know who's gonna build things in space? Uh, that's all good, but we can't do any of that uh, if, we are stopped uh, dead in our tracks uh, by misguided political thinking. And this, this is entirely representative of this. And sadly, this isn't the only source of this. Uh, so this has been going on uh, for a while. There's always been the problems right here on earth crowd. Um, and yet here uh, we find that there's a, a new level of, of what I have to say is, is hysteria directed at space. It's not just yeah, we've got these problems on earth and we want to solve them. It's like, we want to stop you from doing what you're doing because we're so tied up in, the, in managing our current disaster that we don't want anything else going on. Um, and uh, that's truly disturbing, particularly when it's applied to space, which you all know, we'll talk more about it. Uh, Bernie Sanders, same take there, right? So there's definitely a group of folks on the progressive side of the aisle who have misplaced their environmental priorities, thinking that somehow uh, the development, exploration, and, uh, and commercial activity in space is going to be a threat rather than, than a boon to planet Earth. And uh, unfortunately, they're only willing to see one side. The media rewards that message because it's exciting, and they'll keep pumping it out there. Uh, of course, there's no monopoly on stupid. The Wall Street Journal uh, uh, has uh, published an article against space tourism too. So you've got folks on the right who it, uh, uh, would like to take down what we're trying to, to all achieve uh, is a better opportunity for humanity. There is a broad concern uh, and some of it with some scientific basis about the impact of uh, space flight uh, on the atmosphere and, and on, on Earth's uh, uh, fragile biosphere, and, and we should, of course, always be serious about any new uh, system that we add to uh, to our biosphere uh, and evaluate it. That said, um, what you see in the headlines is insanely out of proportion. We're talking about right now uh, dozens of space flights per year. Uh, we might get to hundreds of space flights per year soon. I'd love to see thousands of space flights per year, but there are about 14 million uh, FAA uh, um, uh, tracked airplane flights going on every year. There are like 45,000 a day. Uh, we will never get to that point, and the impact that space will have on that is, is small. I won't go into the, the technical details. There are certainly choices we can make on propellants and, and other things to make sure that we're as considerate as possible, but it is an issue being blown out of control, and the question is, is why is that? Um, and it's because it will play political dividends. Uh, if you can go attack 
Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, and, and Richard Branson, you're going to get press for your political agenda. Uh, and uh, so you'll just add that to the, the, the list of, uh, of enemies that, uh, that you need to, uh, to go after. And this is a serious, serious problem. Do not dismiss this as, oh, they just don't get it. And this is going to go away. Um, we have been here before. And I know this is something that Bob Zubrin is, is very familiar with. In 70 years of, of nuclear power in the United States, nobody has ever been killed by a nuclear power plant. Um, hundreds of people are killed directly by fossil fuel power uh, every year. People are occasionally killed by wind turbine accidents, but nobody's ever, ever, ever been killed by nuclear power. Uh, in fact, probably we're killing hundreds of thousands of Americans every year with a secondary impact of fossil fuels from uh, particulate emissions and hydrocarbon emissions. And yet we lost the nuclear power industry, a very mature and uh, profitable and, uh, and up and coming industry in, in the 1960s uh, that became the cause du jour for post Vietnam protesters. It was though the civil rights and Vietnam protesters now needed something else to go attack and they went and they attacked this technological industry. It was easy to attack because people did not understand it. Uh, anytime you've got a technology that the general public is not capable of, uh, of understanding, they're going to go after it. And in fact, so they have. Um, and when they went after nuclear, they won. If you look at that chart on the left, you can see the electricity generating capacity from nuclear dropping and the number of new uh, nuclear reactors that are going to be licensed is, is down to zero, while the number of retirements is huge. If we go forward and look at this, you'll see the red lines down at the bottom in the 1970s through 90s. These were the reactors that were planned and permitted in the 60s and, uh, and 70s uh, and early 80s, uh, but then finally got built through the 90s, but basically none zero after that. There's been a huge cost to that. Uh, there's been a huge economic cost because nuclear would have provided much cheaper and reliable power to us. There's a huger cost coming up because, frankly, uh, the Green New Deal and the argument that solar is going to power the world is, is a fraud. Uh, nighttime is a thing. Uh, winter is in fact a thing. And in the high latitude, skies are covered with clouds for weeks at a time and the snow in your solar panels are, 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 uh, are obliterated. And this will not solve uh, the climate change problem. Nuclear is the only practical way to do that. And it is not in our quiver because that industry was taken out uh, by a group of politically uh, minded activists who needed a new target to hit. And they are very, very similar to the folks that are coming after space. So do not doubt uh, that if we don't find an organized response to this, that uh, we could in fact find our entire industry uh, shut down. So now that I've scared you, I hope, uh, what, what to do? Uh, well, first of all, we're winning right now. Uh, space is hot, the public in general loves it. There are uh, a lot of folks in the media trying to, to turn them uh, into being opposed to it, but by their very nature, uh, most Americans and most people in the world love exploration and, and daring do and uh, uh, seeing uh, uh, new technologies arrive that promise to make their world more interesting. So the first thing is, is let's not screw up, right? Uh, I beg you to consider stopping the infighting in the space community, all right? And this is all of us. Uh, be rational and, and not emotional. And I'm not going to get into the specifics, but you know there are people there who want only company X to succeed or only company Y to succeed. Uh, they want to shut down other people's programs. Uh, they want to see governmental agencies not able to continue doing what they plan to do for years because they perceive there's only one uh, true religion within in their space technology domain and they know how to do this. And that, that's great. Please play up your solution and why it's the best, but be really careful about attacking the other people in the space community because we need to be united towards the external threat, which is a much more serious issue than the misallocation of capital within the space domain. Uh, stop scoring points off those, those other guys. Uh, seriously consider rolling back the tweets where you're attacking somebody else in, instead of promoting yourself. Uh, consider... Uh, when you make a speech that it's not necessary to try to cancel a government program Z uh, uh, under the misguided belief that you're gonna get that money. Because guess what? 
this is not a zero sum game. Uh, this is something that when I was on the NASA transition team, I spent a lot of time arguing about, which is, you know, let's not argue about whether I want to kill your big government program or you want to stop uh, some commercial program that might be coming from the left coast. Let's instead agree on getting the pie bigger and, and do more in space than we have ever before. Dollars from canceled NASA programs, for instance, do not go to the space project that you love. Uh, Administrator Senator Nelson is not sitting there waiting uh, for uh, a couple of billion dollars to be freed up from somewhere so he can take it and put it in another pot and do the thing that you love. Uh, in fact, the Congress of the United States appropriates each of these programs. And guess what? The folks in the OMB uh, slowly dole that money out to the agency. The NASA administrator can't move more than about $500,000 around and you can't move you know, buy a condo in DC for $500,000. You kill a program you don't like, most likely Congress is gonna take that money and go fund something completely different that they're concerned about today and will get them votes in their district and it will not be space. So it's under, important to understand that even if you think this money is not perfectly well allocated, okay, it's going to a program that is not the technically most efficient thing according to the latest book you read from somebody that you really respect, guess what? It's creating infrastructure, it's funding education, it is making all of space possible. And when some company fails because their system isn't, uh, isn't that efficient or some program the government runs eventually gets shut down, those people who were trained and educated do not evaporate. Those facilities that were built are redeployed. That machining equipment goes on the market and is purchased for cheap by more aggressive entrepreneurial and functional companies. It's okay. Very, very little of that money goes to waste. So I want you to go out there and talk about space everywhere you go. Uh, I am going to segue real quick um, to a, uh, a video that I would like to share. Uh, this is 45 seconds of my, my Senate testimony, something that I was very proud of putting together into uh, to one place. Why spend money in space when we have problems here on Earth? During Apollo, our nation was engaged in an intractable Cold War, a bloody ground conflict in Vietnam. There were bitter disagreements at home over the draft, civil rights, racial injustice, women's equality. Several beloved American leaders were assassinated. Protests roiled our campuses. Riots rocked our cities. The Hong Kong flu pandemic killed nearly 100,000 Americans in 1969. Among that chaos, NASA's moon landing stands as an iconic inspirational moment of those times. Space exploration shifted our tech sector into overdrive and gave us insights and solutions for our environmental challenges. The payback has been huge. America can afford to have a future. America can afford to have a future. The whole world can afford to have a future. And we need to get that message out there and be talking about the positive aspects of the, the future on a daily basis. And, and I charge you all uh, with doing that because you're the informed people, the people that really know what's going on. Uh, you know a lot more than the reporters at, uh, at most of the news agencies that are picking up sound bites that, that are exciting. Um, when we talk about... Uh, rational economic policy supporting entrepreneurship. I wanna go back to that last point on my bullet points about infrastructure and education. So you've got some objective you wanna achieve. Hopefully for most governments, that's uplift the economic standing of everybody uh, in their country. Uh, you know, Try to create a, a little more economic uh, equality, try to create better jobs, right? And so you do that, you look and you've got industry leaders in some sectors. So for instance, in the space sector, uh, you know, we've got SpaceX, ULA, Boeing, Lockheed, uh, Northrop Grumman, the uh, Virgin, et cetera, right? And they have a supply chain, right? And if any one of these companies isn't doing what you think is the most efficient thing, that's okay. They are supporting the supply chain and making sure there's enough aluminum and raw carbon fiber composites and that there are people being trained in the labs at the University of Southern California where I taught before or at Arizona State University where I taught now uh, to build the components that you need to, to build rocket satellites and the other things that, uh, that make everything we wanna do tick, right? 
And because that supply chain exists, then it allows rising stars companies that are less well known to the general public uh, and that are popping up today that even I haven't heard about yet uh, to, to do this, right? So this is how Rocket Lab, Relativity Space, ABL and Spin Launch uh, companies in the, the SoCal uh, um, and Space Hub are, are managing to do uh, incredible things today because this infrastructure and supply chain and human resource base and educational base exist, right? You've got to have all that uh, uh, at the bottom to support. And again, uh, even if a program never delivers anything, it still delivers on these items. We are not launching fast payloads of cash into space. Um, share the message. Uh, one of the things I, I strongly recommend is, is go buy some great books like these three. Uh, there are so many more, uh, but uh, I particularly loved uh, the entrepreneurial spirit of all three of these and the very practical and well-informed uh, 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 presentation by the authors. Um, anything Rod Pyle writes is, uh, is worth reading. Uh, of course, the same with, uh, with Dr. Zubrin. So buy these, hand them out to your friends, okay? Uh, educate the thoughtful moderates that you can reach on the topic. Um, don't bother fighting the crazy negativist, but engage them and be the adult in the room, okay? Be, be the person on the left, not the person on the right, uh, visually, right? Be the person that is presenting facts and solutions, not saying it's the end of the world, put a paper bag over your head and uh, we're doomed, right? Uh, also realize competition is powerful and good. We want more than one solution. We have to have more than one solution. Hopefully the space shuttle taught us that, right? If we didn't have the, the Soyuz, uh, bless its ancient heart, uh, when the uh, Columbia failed, you know, we would have had to abandon the, the International Space Station. If we didn't have SpaceX and um, the backup uh, Antares Cygnus system delivering uh, cargo to the space station, we might've had to abandon the space station when we had failures there on the Russian progress module. And then both of the, uh, uh, the cargo resupply vendors suffered problems. It's okay, competition is a great thing. Aren't we glad we had two vendors and commercial crew? Because if that had been down selected in say 2016, and I know some people want to do that, I suspect they would have down selected to the vehicle that isn't ready yet, right? And so it's good that we have both and we want both to succeed. Uh, we want both of these guys. Uh, they're brilliant, they're hardworking, uh, they're great Americans, they're good human beings. Uh, let us be careful uh, when we trot on anybody's toes. And guess what? National competition is good. If it wasn't for the Cold War, uh, and you know, thank gosh it didn't manifest into anything uh, you know, particularly bloody, we wouldn't have gotten at all where we are now. We wouldn't be having a Mars Society conference, I don't think, because we would have never gotten to the moon and inspired myself and a whole generation of people who are probably sitting in this room to, uh, to be in love with space. It's so important. And to that point, guess what? Competition between the US and China is a good thing. We would achieve much, much less if we combined and worked with and cooperated with the Chinese to do a single unified solution like we did with ISS, right? Uh, we got more done when we were competing with the Russians than when we were working with them. And that isn't to say that wasn't a beautiful relationship and so many astronauts and cosmonauts uh, worked so well together. Uh, but guess what? It didn't stop the Putin regime from uh, going ever, ever, ever and more farther to the fascist right uh, politically. And it did not deliver it all the technological progress that we got out of those years of, of fierce competition. So it's good. It's good if we compete and the, there happens to be a group in the Artemis Accords and a, a Russian, Chinese, North Korean, Iranian uh, moon base. Uh, I think that that is probably an excellent future. Uh, we'll get things done. Um, this is a quote from an article that I wrote a while back. I'd love it if you shared my articles also. Uh, you'll find a lot of them in foreign policy. A future that concentrates on managing the apocalypse without offering the potential for something better is no future at all. Uh, I also wrote an article recently on the space billionaires themselves. And I said, you know, not all of us appreciate uh, egos like Branson, Bezos, or Musk. Uh, but their bigger than life personalities are taking us to places that no one has been before, even the most egotistical men. <laughs> their vision of space is central to the fourth industrial revolution. And this promises to make the returns for the internet boom look teeny uh, as far as what we're gonna do to make, make our planet a better place. Uh, so you know what? Uh, some people are gonna have some fun along the way, uh, including me. That's a good thing. Uh, we should not feel guilty or let these 
folks who uh, are so manifest about the, the disaster that's coming and make us feel guilty when we're having a good time seeing the success of our industry. Uh, educate new leaders. Uh, I got to quickly plug what I'm doing with Thunderbird School of Global Management, launching an executive program in uh, space education uh, to educate a new uh, generation of, of space leaders. Uh, you can go to thunderbird.asu.edu to learn more. Got an incredible faculty there. We've just added uh, Kevin O'Connell from the Office of Space Commerce and Dr. Namatra Goswami. Uh, couldn't be better. Um, I'd like to take some questions. Uh, again, you can find me on foreign policy. I write a lot in space news, Forbes. Please pull out your phone right now and, and follow me on Twitter. Note it is Greg W. Autry. Uh, there is another Greg Autry who even looks a little bit like me. Uh, he is uh, not in the same business I am, uh, but uh, please, please do and, and find me on LinkedIn. Love to connect with you. Questions? Let me see what's in the Q&A. Thanks, Greg. Handing over for Q&A. Uh, Lara, are you taking this one? Absolutely. Um, I can do that, or Greg, if um, if you're willing to look at them, that would also be great, but I can also read some of them aloud. Yeah, if you seem some that you think you want to uh, point out, throw them at me now. Um, let's see. Well, the first one from Dusty, I think it's about this duality, like you talked about fixing the Earth versus going to space, that it doesn't necessarily have to be one or the other, that it's more about things about both of these directions kind of even complementing each other. So their question is, what are some of the Earth benefiting innovations you imagine will uh, we will make from Mars? So something that's going into one direction about the space, but it still can benefit the Earth. You know, that is a great question. And, and, and the, the best answer to it is, I don't have an idea or I'd be patenting it right now. Um, but anytime you solve a big engineering problem uh, and you go into a, a fierce competition uh, based on science and engineering, you're gonna have incredible positive externalities. So nobody expected that the space program would give us the internet and the global positioning system, which by the way, is probably the biggest carbon reducing technology we have making all transportation 15% more efficient. Uh, it made solar power a practical thing. Uh, and NASA was the first group really to put solar panels on the ground and, and, and power communities here on Earth. Um, nobody expected those things. Nobody thought World War II would give us the microwave oven and jet transportation, right? But these things happen. So, you know, I don't know. I do think there's going to be huge developments in pharmaceuticals and biology because that's going to have to be done, right? You can transport some things to Mars very expensive, but people are gonna need their maintenance meds. Uh, and so we're gonna to have to find a way to do, do pharma printing essentially uh, on a small scale. So that's one of the things I think that will come out of this. And I don't doubt when people apply themselves to it, they will. And to do automated uh, medical technologies and surgeries and such uh, over highly latent communications, uh, I think that uh, there'll be a, a lot of great developments there on, on the med tech side. Uh, on the ECLIS side, uh, you know, making environmental control systems that will have applications here on Earth is important. And understanding more about possible climates, right? Uh, why is Mars the way it is? How do you change it? will teach us so much about our own climate. Thank you. Um, another question, um, I think this is an interesting one about when competition can go too far. So the uh, Nina is asking, do we need um, ethics of space explorations? Well, yes, we do. Uh, right. Uh, and I care about that a lot. So we are at a tipping point, which is very similar to uh, the age of exploration, the, the 15th and 16th century, um, when a lot of European countries went out and, uh, and colonized the world. And China made the ill-fated decision to cancel their large exploration programs and did not do that. Uh, the outcomes for that had huge political, economic, cultural, and, and social manifestations that last until this day. So it makes a real difference about whether your country was colonized by, by the Spanish or, or by the British, whether you received uh, you know, the Scottish Enlightenment and uh, uh, and the British legal system, or whether you, you know, started out with the Inquisition, uh, and you know how much slavery was allowed uh, in that culture, and all big differences. Luckily, space has, uh, in our domain at least, no sentient uh, beings whose rights are going to be violated. So that makes the situation similar. We just had a talk on planetary protection. We need to uh, be realistic about the ethics of that. But the ethics are important about how we're going to treat our fellow human beings in space. And that's why I think it's so important that the United States, Britain, Japan, and free democratic nations take the lead into space, because I want to carry those values 
of the Enlightenment uh, uh, and respect for the individual freedom of religion, freedom of speech to space. I do not want to carry authoritarian regimes to space, and I think we need to have an honest uh, talk about that. Not all governmental systems are uh, are equal. That that that's a load of dingo kidneys. Thank you for the answer, and I guess we have a one minute for uh, the last question. Um, so Eric um, is asking. Um, why not to turn um, it around? And it being the, the statement about fixing things in earth, saying that we should argue that to fix the earth, we need to develop these technologies and open up the resources of the solar system for human expansion to relieve the pressure on earth. You're hired, Eric. Uh, there we go. Yeah, so if you read my articles, that's where I'm going. I just mentioned the technologies that we have. And you know, frankly, we wouldn't know squat hardly about climate change if it wasn't for data from NASA satellites and overflights looking at the ocean, looking at the atmospheric content, looking at the ice caps, if it wasn't for all the NOAA buoys at sea, which all communicate via satellite uh, data on, on sea temperature changes. Uh, we wouldn't uh, have the GPS constellations, which provide signal occultation, uh, which allows us to learn a lot more about the changing atmospheric composition. Uh, if we couldn't look and see what happened to Venus and what happened to Mars, planets very, very similar to ours, and, and try to figure out why they took drastically different climate uh, paths, uh, we would probably be in a much less informed position now and in the future. So yeah, we absolutely need to, to talk up the solutions and the data. And it is just absurd uh, that uh, the, the Prince or, or Greta or Bernie or anybody would stand up and say that, that space is not compatible with the environment. It is in essence the environment. And uh, the whole environmental movement came out of that 1960s photo that uh, Anders took of, of the earth rising uh, uh, over the moon. Everybody looked at that and saw that, that, that small vulnerable blue marble and, and realized you know, we had to protect it. It, it changed our perspective and, and that's really why the environmental movement took off. So I wish I could go on. Thank you so much. Thanks, Greg. We're out of time, but it was delightful to have you here today. Hope you can join us again next year. <laughs> Absolutely. In person, I hope. But in any case, yes. be there. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. All right. Our next, uh, we have two, two speakers. That Sorry, Susan, I just muted you by accident. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Um, Clicking too sure. fast there. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so we have two distinguished members from the British Inter Interplanetary Society with us today. Uh, Patrick Rennie, who is also the Mars Society UK president, and Fabrizio uh, Bernardini. Uh, and they are going to talk to us about engineering for Mars. Gentlemen, welcome. Okay, can you, can you see me? How we start? Yes. I can. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning to everybody. Depends when you are on, on this planet. Let's talk about the other planet first. In just one minute, let me share the presentation. And uh, so, this one. Can you see it? Yes, we can see it. Perfect. Okay. So despite the title, this presentation is about water ice on Mars again, you can say, but in particular, we will explore why in our opinion, this is going to affect all future projects or plans to explore this planet and how it will affect it in ways that we do not think have been well considered so far. So as uh, Susan said, we are from the British Interplanetary Society. We also do other things in our life, of course. And I say that uh, working around Mars is uh, pretty exciting to be uh, attending this conference for the first time. So thanks for the invitation. And uh, in the last decade, uh, you saw a presentation yesterday, studies about the presence of water ice at mid latitudes provided the quantity estimates that are completely different from the common knowledge that has driven mass exploration so far. Compared with the previous knowledge, uh, the new estimates are so high that may have failed to register as real in many contexts. In fact, uh, we see that most uh, studies of habitats and also the scope of Earth analogs project of experiences, they still fail to consider this aspect. Consider this, this image, on, for instance, this is from a preliminary study, and I keep using since a few years already, which was limited to the amount of water ice in the glaciers discovered at that time in 2014. That study set the estimate to be at least 400,000 cubic kilometers of water ice. And we are talking about nearly pure water ice because we know that for sure. In other words, 
we think that the availability and accessibility of so much water ice actually force a paradigm shift for what regards the engineering of Mars. And take note that this image only took care of the glaciers, not the ground ice, the subsurface ice layers, and so on. We will see them later. And um, in the recent year, more detailed studies have concentrated on mapping this critical resource. And the results are more extensive, taking into consideration also ground ice and underground ice layers. So the swing study, which has been descri described yesterday by Dr. Pozik, my colleague actually, if you think about it, it is the very first full global mapping of a resource on another celestial body, which is critical to humans. This is a very first for humankind. An incredible result, which is also driven in good part by Sharad, the Italian radar on mass reconnaissance orbit. We should guide all future projects as it is now guiding the selection of human landing sites. So the point we would like to make this evening, this evening for us is that the presence of large quantities of water ice produces major simplifying assumption for every, acti every activity, every design every project that will be conducted on Mars. And it also induces new needs that have to be considered in Mars project, uh, technological needs actually. So all this translates uh, in uh, a different way of solving many problems. And it is also going to drive the way engineering is applied to Mars projects. Let's discuss why. And, but before that, uh, consider a couple of facts. I, put here just some notes, uh, things to remember about uh, how difficult uh, is working on Mars. And, uh, and uh, consider also the pure ice in a glacier is at about, about a minus 90 degrees, at, at minus 80 degrees, the, the ice is going to be as hard as rock. This is uh, something that must be considered. Note also that uh, without engineering, there is not going to be a beautiful habitat or, or anything else we want to do on Mars. Engineering comes first. And we have to take care of that. So what is driving this paradigm shift is the incredible of the huge quantity of accessible water ice. Accessible is the key part. And uh, this ice has to be extracted. It has to be uh, stored. It has to be processed. And uh, this, uh, the products of the processing itself, it could be fuel, it could be oxygen, it could be air, it could be propellant, whatever. It uh, has to be stored also. So this, the storage of these products is also critical for any human activity on Mars because without these products, you cannot do anything. You cannot properly design anything else. All this, which is the extraction, the storage, and the processing of the materials requires also energy. energy and requires machinery and requires structures. For the energy, you can see yesterday presentation about nuclear fission generator. It was a fantastic presentation and it's really enlightening and it was right on the spot. It could have been a part of this presentation actually. Machinery structures and energy all need engineering with appropriate methods and standards designed for Mars. In particular, we have to highlight also the importance of maintenance. And for maintenance itself, we need a specific engineering approach since the very early stage of any Martian project. So what we have to do is, in this case, to engineer maintenance into the designs because on Mars, you cannot rely on NASA-like or ESA-like spacecraft components. Sophisticated technologies that when you use in spacecrafts can be killers if you can't fix them. And you cannot count forever on space parts. And of course, the nearest hardware store is pretty unreachable. Therefore, we think that the science shall include the possibility of what we call creative human maintenance. And to enable this, a good starting point is the standardization. Standardization is something that has to be enforced for tools, material, processes, interfaces, and components. It's also important to avoid too many different things. And because uh, we want to use as much as possible similar in part on components in different projects. Otherwise it's just a confusion of things and uh, useless parts. And please let's, let's avoid to have both Imperial and metric on Mars. Eh? I, I give you a suggestion, metric could be better, but I'm not going to enforce this. Let's take uh, as an example, 
the, the tunnel boring machines. The tunnel boring machines are, uh, you know, on earth can be small, medium, and large, very large sometimes, a huge machine. Sometimes they are built only for a single use. We are not proposing the tunnel boring machine as a solution. We are not talking about solutions here. What we are using the tunnel boring machine as, a, as an example of engineering. However, it could be actually be a very good solution for Mars because uh, we will see that later. But anyway, the TBM has very nice characteristics. It's a very simple conceptually. It has uh, a, an electrical motor, replaceable. It has a replaceable actuator. You see the blue, the blue parts here. And you also have the cutters that can be replaced. Every component can also be swapped with other systems. For example, the motor can be used also for another system, but also the motor can be repaired on Mars if it is designed according to red lines that enforce a simplification and commonalization of parts. So why the TBM is very useful, actually? Because uh, this is an example of good engineering in the sense that this, uh, let's call it a tool, can also solve other problems. It, it, it is going to be used for the main thing that is getting to the ice, but it also provides help with other problems like the extraction of the ice because grinding it, uh, remember that it's as hard as a rock, uh, it can save a lot in melting energy and also can provide uh, in the in the hole that it produces in the end, it can provide shelter for early habitats. The first, uh, the first uh, holes we will drive in the glaciers using these can be useful with inflatable, uh, with inflatable um, um, modules, the one that also Thales and Space showed this morning. And uh, they can be easily used in this condition, we provide also radiation shields and everything. So the solution, if it's a single machine, you, you take care of at least three different main problems. Another critical aspect to consider is uncertainties. Engineering shall always take care of uncertainties, even of the unforeseen ones. So applying typical spacecraft redundancy in this case is going to be impractical. And in general, redundancy at system level, so that is replaced the entire system, it, it's, a, it's not really a good idea because it should actually target a differentiation instead of duplication. There is an example here about uh, having as a primary power source a nuclear fission reactor and the main alternative could be solar arrays. And also a backup could be found because if you store the propellants you do, you can, in case of emergency, use the propellants to produce energy again. So this is a, way, a good way of thinking because you don't want system, light, system, system level issues to create a big problem to the economy. So the redundancy should concentrate on parts and function that should take advantage of commonality among systems, not only for parts and components, but also sharing the functionalities when possible. Therefore, it is, a, for example, it is important to think in terms of redundancy of the design more than that of the element. And this requires, of course, in engineering of the redundancy to be able to coordinate the design and systems. This and other concept are going in the end to establish what we call a technological ecosystems in which uh, uh, there is an overall interaction of all the systems, part, component, and tools. So all things can be integrated together. They work together to achieve the, the project we want to do. Together with standardization, this integrated approach to redundancy also means that the left hand has to know what the right hand does. And there is a simple message. The previous speaker just said that to avoid conflicts in the space community, the same thing. Systems cannot be designed each in their own intellectual vacuum. We have to work together. We, who design a system should work together doing people doing other system. Ideally, there should be a guideline, there should be a controlling, not really an authority, but there should be something about a global system engineering method that applies to Mars. Getting back to contingencies, having the, to deal with contingencies or unforeseen situation and problem is going to be the real challenge for engineering on Mars. So it will be necessary not only to fix, but also to rebuild parts and create tools. In this, the planet ability to recycle part, components and materials will be a critical advantage. So we are talking about uh, a recycling technology at all levels. So uh, you have to build for recycling. Like we do today, for example, the packaging of certain products that are built for recycling. You know? We have to do the same things for the design that goes to Mars because if something breaks, you cannot use it anymore. You, you can split it into smaller parts and use it for other things, for example. 
SpaceX already indicated this because the first, the first uh, Starship to land on Mars are going to stay on Mars and they will be used for spare parts and materials and steel especially. Uncertainties may require developing new solution and a good dose of the so-called maker attitude will be useful as well as uh, a good equipped workshop because you need a workshop to do making <laughs> as everybody knows. And uh, so in the end also the same criteria will have to be defined so to permit that elements are adaptable to multiple uses or also design which are based on modularity which is contrary today we do we do a very tight integration of every system but no we have to try to do modular components that participate in multiple design and of course we need good interfaces because good interfaces anyway are the, the basis for any for system engineering in any context Let's now consider a little bit of the location factor. And uh, different landing sites uh, with the multiple sources of water ice uh, of different kinds, uh, just, to, just to reduce the risk of the first landings, are under evaluation. But one of the three, four major ones uh, is the area called Deuternilus Mens. This is the Latin pronunciation. And uh, it's one of the best places, in our opinion, to implement a large scale approach to colonize Mars. Uh, we, we are taking large scale here, and there are good reasons to that. You will see that in the next slide. Consider the picture on the right. This comes from uh, Mars Express uh, high resolution stereo camera. And uh, this is a, an overview of a corner of the outer And uh, and uh, it, it it's, it's a very good picture, but uh, you, maybe you don't see really everything, but all these features you see around this kind of mountains, these are actually called the mesas by my geologist friends. And uh, all this area, all these things, and this is, it is water ice. Look at this map from the top. This is, uh, of course, it's uh, just uh, a rendering of uh, the altimetry data. This is just a small portion of this area, and this is a square which is uh, 150 kilometers per side. And this area is probably large, as large at least four or five times this, even more. If you look at these mesas from the top, uh, you see this, they are very flat, this is why they are called mesas. And uh, you see that they are surrounded by this area, this, uh, this um, I don't know how to say that in English, but basically there is something around them. Well, this is something around them, it's a it's what we call the debris covered glaciers. These are the famous glaciers on Mars that have discovered by radar. And uh, we are talking, consider this is 150 kilometers, you understand the size of these glaciers. These glaciers, they can reach at the ice point something like a, an average of 400 meters, and they, so they are extended for many kilometers. The, the amount of water ice in this area is, is in, unthinkable. It's really unthinkable. And uh, the idea of having also these mountains, they provide additional shielding for the habitats, but also they provide also landscape. Some places on Mars are really flat and boring. Look at the typical landing sites that are usually very flat and boring, but for good safety reasons. But uh, this area is also nice to see. I have uh, one of our geologists in our team say, this is a good place for hiking. And, uh, but also they have, uh, they offer the possibility of having probably caves or, or fractures in the, surf, in the, in the rock, in the, in the sides of the mountains that can um, permit the, the creation of uh, cliff dwelling habitats like the one you see here on the left from Mesa Verde in Colorado. So this area, for example, just imagine if you have an opening like this and we can close it and we can pressurize it. And then inside this area, using local materials, and using all the water ice we want, all the water we want, we can build housing using local material. We don't have any fancy or exotic material imported from Earth to build the houses for a colony. This is me thinking big, but it also means building bricks on Mars, for example. This is one. The reason why engineering should start since the very beginning with a large scale approach, because this area is huge and it permits a lot of things. Another consideration about this is that you cannot do this immediately from the start. So there is going to be an evolutionary approach. So we, we just uh, define three stages. We call them the we call them we call them the campsite. The first one where you land, you start uh, putting up some modules, maybe what is the first thing you do? you start 
generating, you start excavating ice and producing water and propellant. This is important because you want to come back. Okay, then you start developing better here and it becomes a settlement. And this settlement is going again to increase what the, the, the production, sorry, the excavation, the extraction of water ice and the production of propellants again and also setting up energy. And then you keep scaling up things, uh, working in the same area and keep doing the same thing. Uh, the, 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 these three stages are nothing new for this community, of course, but consider the emphasis on water ice extraction and propellant, propellant production. So we can start small, but this is not so small. You will see that in the next slide. And then we have to start immediately extraction, processing, and storage immediately from the very start. And also considering new, new, new resources should be also considered. We have to set up agronomy and these things. All these things, the common factor for everything will be the technology used on Mars and therefore their engineering. The machinery, structures, tools shall evolve and they will be able to evolve only if appropriate methods are followed. So we are not proposing an approach here. What we are, what we are proposing is that there are guidelines needed to make it happen. And uh, from now on, it's on Patrick. Thank you, Fabrizio. So hopefully we've already convinced you that there is a functionally limitless abundance of water ice. But so what? Okay, well, let's talk about scale for a second then. Consider this as an example of scale where, okay, we're going to have to make quite a few assumptions to start with. So take a starship, launch your cargo ship in an appropriate launch window. We all aware of the synodic period of Earth and Mars, so say every 2.2 years or so. So you launch your cargo ship and let's get a bit sporty. Let's assume we can arrive on the surface of Mars in 150 days, down from the typical home and transfer of say 240. Um, really, after you've landed, you want to get the ship filled up before humans even opt to leave from the surface of the Earth. Okay, so if you take that synodic period again and you say we have about therefore 630 days to fill starship up that means we now have to manufacture in round numbers 1200 tons of propellant that's the combination of course of methane and LOX, oxygen sorry um, in really really round numbers if you take into account say pure water ice and a perfect Sabatier reaction and perfect electrolysis of the water to split it into hydrogen and oxygen, ignoring how much energy it takes. We're still talking about over a thousand tons of pure ice to completely fill the starship. Now, those major caveats of, of the really broad assumptions we've just made there also um, don't take into account how much propellant is actually needed to fill starship to come home. I can't make any assumptions. I'm not a SpaceX engineer. I don't know what the, the Delta V to come home is, so can't, can't make a guess. But let's say that we fill it up completely. It's that 1,200. That's also ignoring how much ice is needed to be processed for the people that are going to arrive. So it's probably a minimum assumption. And we're, we're now talking in the thousands of tonnes over the, the two-year period or so that the, the ship will need to be generating generating the methane and oxygen over. So now, hopefully, we are thinking big, okay? And th this is just the first few missions because this is what's needed from the start. This is to come home again on one ship. Um, so now we're thinking big. So why isn't that compatible with the current engineering paradigm? Well, because at the moment, most of what we carry to Mars or to the moon, wherever we choose to go, is going to be, in the current paradigm, spare parts for highly complex and niche systems. We are limiting ourselves on the scale of possible missions when we have to bring everything with us. So we should it. The next slide, please. So we've already shown you this diagram for Ritzio presented it earlier. But let's summarize the main points that we've we've been trying to get across here. So the first one is abundant water ice enables us to think differently about how we conduct missions to Mars. We should rethink what redundancy means. Just, just dwell on that word for a second, the word redundancy. We can't sustainably bring 
a huge proportion of spare parts when we're talking on the large scales of missions. It's completely impractical. So we need to design everything from the outset to be standardized. As Fabrizio said, interfaces need to be the same. We don't want to be on Mars and figure out that the valve on the water tank can't be replaced because the other systems don't match it. We can't afford that. Tools will need to be the same. I'm sure I'm not the only one. I'm sure there are piles of us with piles of different screwdrivers and spanners sat in the garage just for that one job that you need it for. Parts need to at least be modular and or be capable instead of being rigged up for another job a different type of redundancy, as Fabrizio said, a differentiation redundancy where one part could do multiple jobs. And so in the whole ecosystem of parts, you can cover your redundancy without necessarily having spares of everything all the time. Everything needs to be fixable. If we absolutely can't fix something, then at least we should be able to strip it down for those parts and give them to the other systems. And all of this needs to be thought about from the very beginning. Next slide, please. So we have presented some engineering ideas, all founded on the proposition of the vast amounts of accessible water ice, in case that point hasn't been drilled home enough. So where can we go from here? We propose an integrated effort to guide the principles of how to engineer for the human exploration and settlement of Mars. We're not proposing the answers, the possible missions, habitat designs, or anything like that, but instead the framework by which you would architect those things. This is the systems engineering of Mars. The next step we propose is to take this forward as a technical project by the British Interplanetary Society, just like some historic programs that have come before. However, Next slide, please. We can't do this alone. This is a, a call to action for interested parties to reach out to us. Our details will be on the next slide so that we can carry this paradigm shift into the next phase. And just to be clear, what you can see in this picture now, these mountains, they are completely surrounded by debris covered glaciers. The peaks in this image are about two kilometers tall, which means the surrounding glacier is many kilometers across and perhaps hundreds of meters deep. We got five just, minutes left, Patrick. Thank you. Just to dwell on that for a second, we're all blown away by the sheer size of Starship, right? It's, it's enormous. But when you next gaze upon its magnificent height, realize that it is absolutely dwarfed by this glacier, you would struggle to make it out in this picture. So let us take advantage of this staggering resource and exploit it for the good of humans to Mars. Thank you. Thanks to all listening to us. We are open to questions. Absolutely. All right. Um, thank you very much, Patrick and Fabrizio. Um, my name is Lara, and I'm going to ask a couple of questions on behalf of the audience. So Please. the first question is... Um, for orbiting structures and associated construction, has there been consideration for using space junk for material? Okay. Uh, Do you want to take this one for Britsia or shall I? Yes, because, uh, because uh, <laughs> this is a topic that is really dear to my heart because <laughs> I actually wanted to propose it somewhere. I think we are throwing away too much stuff. I think that instead, to, I think person, this is a personal thinking, of course, maybe Patrick does not share this. But I think that instead of burning up uh, stuff into the atmosphere, it's all this precious technology, and even just the aluminum uh, and, uh, and the other stuff that we bring to the space station and other places, we should actually send them to a higher orbit and, uh, and do some kind of a graveyard of this hardware. And maybe one day we will have a low propulsion system like a ion engine or something that slowly brings these things in the vicinity of Mars that could be used for the future. That would be that would be a great uh, yes that would be a great project. I like this because because I am a person that does, I don't like to throw away things. So my house is a little bit uh, pocket full, as you can imagine. But yes, I think this could be something we have to think about. That. Yeah, uh, to add to that, I, I don't disagree with your point there, Fabrizio. Um, <laughs> we 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 are quite wasteful in low Earth orbit. I would yeah. add that it's significantly easier 
to get to low Earth orbit than it is to get to Mars. And the the utility of space junk might be, it might be really difficult to recycle. So th the idea about chucking it somewhere for the future generations to solve, I, I don't disagree with that. For the immediate term, I think it would be really hard to recycle space junk. I'm all for getting rid of it, but I don't know how one would recycle it at the present time. I can have ideas. The next one. <laughs> Thank you. So the next question is, for Mars infrastructure and maintainability issues, would additive manufacturing, 3D printing be beneficial? That's for you, Patrick. Okay. Um, well, I've actually seen alternative presentations from uh, the likes of European Space Agency, a, a colleague, shall we say, called uh, Dr. Advanit Lakaya, who advocates for 3D printing the Martian regolith on the surface. Um, in terms of maintainability, um, 3D printers are quite attractive. There will be some engineering constraints on the operation of a 3D printing machine. Um, I would not be certain how to additively manufacture using metals on the surface of Mars. Um, if you were to think about the typical plastic hobbyist machines that we might have at home, um, they're really good for, for recycling and um, maintainability and reuse because ultimately if you have a material that you can um, melt down and reuse then it is vastly recyclable in any which way um, i know from personal experience with 3d printing that recycling the filament is quite challenging to do and it lowers okay. the structural integrity of the filament when you recycle it but uh i think the concept the philosophy is a good one I hope that answers the question. Uh, gentlemen, we are out of time, but we thank you very, very much for being with us today. Uh, brilliant work, very exciting. Um, I'm gonna hand this over now to Carrie yeah. Bay, who's going to introduce our final plenary speaker of the day. Thanks for being with us, gentlemen. Thank, thank you. you, Susan. Thank you, Susan. Um, I turned off my video because um, right now um, it is dark <laughs> where I am right now. Um, the sun is behind the clouds and so my video is a little dark so I'm just going to leave that off. Our next speaker today, um, I, I have an honor of introducing. Um, she is currently a researcher at the Institute of Biomedical Problems in Moscow and her name is Anastasia Stepanova. Hello Anastasia, nice to see you again. Hello, it's a pleasure to be in the Martian family. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, Anastasia is going to be talking about the preparation of humans for deep space flights. Take it away, Anastasia. Thank you. Okay. Let's start. <laughs> We're uh, not seeing your video, Anastasia. I don't know if you want to stop and restart that. I'm not sure if we lost her. It looked like her um, connection kind of froze up. I'm sure she'll log right back on. Yep. I see her again. I think she dropped off, so we'll wait for her to join back again. I'm just going to put the slide up. So then.
And we're just waiting for Anastasia Stepanova to rejoin. So she should be back on momentarily. And she's rejoining now. Can you hear us, Anastasia? Can you hear us, Anastasia? Can you hear us, Anastasia? Oh, she's having some problems. She's up oh, there. She is. We can see you, Anastasia. She dropped off again. Well, let's just hang out here and see if she rejoins. Okay, she's back on. Let's try this one more time. And yeah, Carrie, if she's good, I would introduce her again, just so we have a clean recording. Yes, sorry, I'm back. Um, I don't know what happened. Um, Hi, Anastasia, it's Carrie. Um, yeah. Just for new folks that may have um, come on, I'm just gonna give a quick introduction again, um, so that folks know who you are. Um, I would like to introduce to um, everyone Anastasia Sipanova, and she is currently a researcher at the Institute of Biomedical Problems in Russia, and her uh, discussion today will be about the preparation of humans for deep space flights. Take two, Anastasia. Thank you. So I have 20 minutes, I guess. I lost time on connection. Sorry. 
No, you can take as long as you need, Anastasia. It's fine. Yeah, you you can go a little longer. You're the last speaker. Okay, um, I'm happy to be here as always. Uh, so today we will talk how we can prepare uh, humans to uh, fly to the moon and to the Mars. And we've been studying it at Institute of Biomedical Problems since um, early 60s. And uh, first very extreme uh, isolation experiment actually happened in 1967, uh, where uh, three test subjects spent one year in 12 square meters. Uh, this experiment called a year in Starship. Uh, and uh, back then it was proved that actually um, humans are very adaptive uh, to uh, confined uh, places, confined space, and um, that um, we can uh, survive uh, psychological pressure. Um, although uh, three is not the perfect number uh, for uh, healthy psychological um, well-being, but uh, why our scientists chose uh, this number because they didn't want to have the division into groups. Um, but anyway, there was a division into groups. So there was uh, two um, two guys that were uh, together, like that two two guys that found uh, common much more common, and then there was one guy that was um, always aside. Uh, and um, this caused uh, even a little bit of uh, physical uh, problems on his health during the constant stress uh, during this one uh, year. Uh, another interesting thing is, is that um, it, there was even a love story um, in this experiment. So uh, outside of the um, this, this space chamber, there was a and scientists and doctors and uh, very often they were communicating uh, through speakers so uh, one of the test subjects was always hearing a really nice voice of uh, a lady and he fell in love with the, her voice and um, when he came out after one year uh, they actually got married so uh, although it was really harsh experiment uh, and uh, but it has a happy ending um, and it proved that we can move uh, towards this direction and um, create new isolation experiments, uh, which will be uh, not as harsh, but still more complex in terms of uh, getting uh, scientific data on uh, how, uh, our, uh, how our physiology and psychology reacts to this um, isolation. So, in space, we have several extreme factors for humans. Um, and uh, in IBMP, we um, consider that isolation and psychological factor is uh, very crucial. Um, after that, uh, we created a new uh, station, much bigger as you can see here. So it consists of uh, five modules um, and each module called after the uh, volume um, which it has. So we have uh, 250 cubic meters, 100, 150, 50, and uh, um, a hangar that uh, simulates, you can see it here, uh, Martian surface or moon surface. It's up to us which surface we can simulate, maybe even a Titan. Uh, and um, for now, uh, Mars 500 experiment that lasted 520 days and simulated flight to Mars and back. Uh, actually, it's uh, still a record-breaking experiment in the duration. It happened back in 2010. And uh, we have here six uh, crew members. Um, and uh, also interesting facts that um, these crew members couldn't ideally connect, communicate with each other because, for example, Chinese crew member, he didn't know Russian and he didn't know English. Uh, and uh, after a few months, uh, our psychologist um, saw that actually they communicate quite well and they found their own language. Of course, this experiment was not easy uh, and there was um, interesting um, reactions to isolation. For example, they all lost uh, a lot of weight when they came back. Um, and uh, there was also a food studies and, uh, but 
even though if they were eating as much as, as they were eating here back on Earth, they would still lose weight. And maybe this is also, also uh, caused by a stress that maybe they wouldn't even realize. Uh, and another interesting factor is um, a phenomenon of third quarter. Um, this um, uh, means that it doesn't matter which uh, duration you have the isolation period. Uh, it can be uh, months or it can be um, four months or uh, 520 days. Uh, exactly in the middle of this uh, period, you have a rapid change in the mood and kind of like a depression. Uh, and um, our psychologists uh, think that this is because uh, you realize that uh, you already have done so much, but you uh, need to do uh, exactly the same amount of time in this um, environment and in this, in this isolation. And uh, this can cause also not uh, like a bad mood. And it's interesting to understand, uh, is it good to know this factor before you go into isolation? Or uh, maybe it's not the best to know it because you kind of uh, will start to think, okay, at this moment, I would start to have a, a bad temper. But if you don't know this factor and uh, anyway, you have the depression at this period, um, that <clears throat> also can be uh, risky because you will start to doubt yourself and uh, maybe uh, even make it worse, your condition. So um, I think it's better to know all the theories and uh, different phenomena that happen in isolation in terms of psychological uh, health and be prepared for them. Um, Mars 500 also proved that we can uh, still have a successful mission. Of course, with, uh, I wouldn't say it was ideal. Of course, there was some uh, minor um, conflicts and people were not all <laughs> happy all the time, but we have the same things here on earth. But um, nevertheless, no one uh, said that we want to uh, end this mission before the uh, final period when it should be ended. And um, we consider it a success. <laughs> um, and you can see that here, yes, um, it's a wooden, uh, wooden uh, uh, it's all covered in wood and it looks like a sauna, but uh, this was made uh, also from psychological support that uh, our psychologist said that it's mostly, it's mo most healthy to see wood around you. Of course, we're not going to have it uh, on a real space station or Mars stations, and uh, we need to think which material will be uh, most pleasant for your psychological support, but also in terms of ecological uh, environment. Um, in a hermetic volume, uh, where you have your own atmosphere and pressure, uh, it's important that all materials wouldn't leak any uh, gases that would be um, not, um, that would be risky for a human. Uh, and it means not like in, a, it, it should be considered during the long period of time. So anything that we bring into our station, we first test in a special oven uh, on a different temperatures and for many, many days, uh, how it's disintegrate the material. And uh, this is a really also very interesting and important direction into the space architecture and that uh, we need also consider uh, how it will look and from what it will be made, uh, uh, Mars Station. Um, after that, there was uh, several other experiments, but um, in 2014, we started our major cooperation with NASA, uh, Human Resource Program. And uh, they asked us to uh, have a joint studies and uh, international crew um, on isolation, but with during uh, with a different duration. So it was 70 days, then it was four months where I took part of. And then um, actually in November, we start uh, eight months 
there will be another crew. And then after that, we have one year and one year. Uh, and again, why we are doing it here in Moscow at the station, because it's quite unique. Um, it looks interesting, I know, <laughs> not modern, not like in a Space Odyssey movie, uh, but uh, it has really complex life support systems uh, and uh, it's, it has its own atmosphere, air pressure, um, fully hermetic with um, control of uh, any uh, gases that you have in your atmosphere. And um, the only one thing that is not on a spaceship, of course, apart from wood, is that all systems controlled from outside. So we have 24 seven um, crew that uh, looking after our test subject uh, and it consists of engineers and doctors. Okay, and uh, I have been talking about this isolation before at Mars Site Convention and um, I wanna say, talk about new experiments that we had. For example, um, we have another extreme factor in space. It's microgravity that causes uh, quite negative effect on uh, uh, our physiology. And um, back in uh, 70s, uh, when our cosmonauts were flying in a small spaceship for 17 days, uh, and they uh, arrived to Earth and they couldn't even get out from the spaceship. They were so weak and they had muscle atrophy and heart problems. Back then, scientists decided to uh, create a model that will help uh, to study the effects of microgravity and which countermeasure we can use. Uh, so first there was a dry, uh, wet immersion. Uh, and uh, our test subjects basically were inside of the bath in um, a special suit, but still they were touching uh, water. So this is not the good solution. After that, uh, it was decided to create a dry immersion. Uh, and as you can see here, it's a, a bath covered with waterproof uh, cloth. And uh, then uh, there is a test subject that lays down there for several days. Of course, extreme uh, 56 days were back in Soviet times. But now um, in modern uh, Russia, we have uh, the most, uh, the longest uh, dry immersion ex uh, experiment. It was 21 day. Uh, but although it's been uh, uh, conducted during uh, 50 years, only uh, last year, there was a first dry immersion with female test subject. And they decided to do it short, only three days, because they were uh, not sure which, um, uh, how we, we would react to that. Uh, and I would tell you, because I was also a test subject in this experiment, uh, that we've been also um, a bit worried how we would uh, differ from a uh, male test subject. And uh, for us, it was really important experiment to prove that um, women can fly to space and that uh, they are as robust and strong as uh, uh, men. And uh, it's interesting is that um, uh, the first observation that I can share now publicly that uh, all, almost all uh, male test subject during the dry immersion, which was seven days or 21 day, um, they had uh, back pain problems. And uh, this back pain started on a second day. And uh, uh, it started on second day, but after fifth day, um, the pain disappeared. So in our case, uh, all women felt uh, quite good. We didn't. We had the six test subject, and we didn't have any back pain. Uh, we had some other difficulties, but it's more connected to um, our anatomy uh, in terms of uh, uh, going to the toilet and uh, how to um, how to do it in a horizontal position. Also, if you're inside of the water bath uh, and without any support for your body. So of course, um, there are more um, articles to be published soon, I hope, uh, regarding the, um, our physiological response to that. 
but uh, all other um, negative effects that usually happened with uh, male test subject happened to us also. Um, what does it mean? It means that you lose on the first day a lot of liquid because your body wants to get rid of extra uh, blood pressure. Um, your spine uh, stretches in one centimeter or one centimeter and a half. Um, your um, blood system also changes and uh, you don't feel so well during first few days. And uh, the downside of our experiment, although for some people it seems like, oh, three days, it's not so much. But actually in these three days, your uh, uh, physiology starts to rapidly and extremely as, uh, adapting to a new environment. Uh, and you don't feel really well. And on the third day, uh, that's the moment where your body is already adapting and you would start to feel much better. But with us on the third day, they were taking us out of the bath. And so we had to readapt to earth gravity and to new environment again. So it was uh, very interesting and extreme, uh, but still uh, we had uh, great test subjects and they all um, survived it very well. So um, I, I heard that in, um, in France, they would start the dry immersion experiment with also female test subject, maybe, um, yeah, I think in November. And it's interesting how, which results they would get. And I hope it will be more and more because we need to uh, study also uh, female uh, physiology um, because I don't, I can't even imagine that we are going to Mars and staying there and there will be only one gender. Uh, that wouldn't fully represent Earth. So I'm um, hoping we have more and more research on that. And um, another experiment that we uh, also combine sometimes with dry immersion, but also we can have it uh, separately. It's short radius centrifuge that we also have at IBMP. Uh, so in order to have a countermeasures uh, for microgravity, our scientists um, presented the short radius centrifuge. And uh, uh, there were um, several research on which load we should use and how. And uh, the best way actually to use the longitudinal axis from head to toe. Uh, which creates uh, the same effect that we have here on Earth uh, with uh, Earth gravity um, uh, connecting to the hydrostatic blood pressure in our body. Uh, and uh, our scientists uh, offered this uh, short radius centrifuge to actually be on a space station uh, or, or on a spaceship that flies to Mars because it will take seven to eight months. And uh, although we have this exercise on ISS, which um, keep our cosmonauts and astronauts healthy, but this still won't be enough to arrive to Mars and be uh, physically ready to explore the planet, to build something. So uh, we would need still the uh, short radio centrifuge uh, for that. And another really extreme factor that we would have on Mars. Uh, it's uh, almost uh, almost absence of um, a magnetic field on Mars. And we started also in this year experiment called ARFA, where we decrease the magnetic field uh, in a uh, thousand times. Uh, and you can see it's a special, it looks like a cage. <laughs> um, and our test subject stayed there for eight hours. Uh, and uh, for several days, they come uh, the next day, stay again eight hours. And so uh, here we test uh, cognitive and operation functions um, and in indicators of pain sensitivity. Um, after the research on mice um, in hypermagnetic environment, uh, scientists said that uh, the uh, low magnetic field affects cognitive functions and also the fertility. 
And of course, we don't want our astronauts on Mars to become dumb <laughs> uh, and to lose it. So um, here we're trying to study this effect, but so far the results that um, there was no effect. And I think it's because of the duration, eight hours, of course, it's not much. Um, and it's interesting how we can find the solution to um, prolong this period and uh, who would agree to that, <laughs> uh, who would be the volunteers, because it's quite risky. Uh, but we'll see. Um, and yes, here you can see more about this uh, equipment that we use. Of course, inside of the case, you cannot use any electrical device. And uh, our test subject told us that it's very, um, the hardest thing is just to uh, stay there for eight hours without using uh, means of communication, but they are playing chess and uh, reading books. So here um, I uh, covered three main um, extreme factors that humans can face and will face uh, uh, during long uh, space flight. Uh, and I'm happy to answer questions, but consider that I'm not, um, I don't have medical background. I'm just a test subject, but uh, so consider your questions not very uh, medical or scientific. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Anastasia. Um, I'll ask you a couple of questions. My name is Lara. I'll ask you a couple of questions on behalf of the audience. Um, let's see. Well, one of the first questions that we've had, it was more about, it was more of a comment, but um, um, it would be interesting to hear your opinion and maybe some insights that you know about the this gender dynamics. So on the picture of the Mars 500 project, the person, Nina, they did not see any women on the picture, but then you've uh, talked a little bit more about the female text, uh, test subjects. Um, so it's just interesting to hear on um, your opinion of what is the trajectory of what is the future of gender balance in those space programs? Yes, it's getting better. <laughs> um, and uh, with a project that we, we are doing with NASA, a uh, project named the Sirius. So, uh, um, in this uh, project, we need to have three crew members, uh, which are female and three are male. This is uh, the number one rule. And it's also interesting to, uh, for our psychologists to study the group dynamics, uh, how it changes from, for example, uh, Mars 500, where we had only uh, male test subject. And um, on the uh, recent analysis, they said that Actually, um, women, they balanced uh, men. And um, if in the beginning of isolation, there was a, um, quite a difference in approaching the problems and solving them or interaction with the mission support, uh, after several months, um, it uh, was all um, mixed. And um, at the end, the group dynamic was uh, very similar. It, there was no difference between uh, female and male reaction, which is very interesting. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. And we have one question from the Outspace VR. Okay. Um, let's see, I'm not, huh, well, um, as they're setting up, I'll ask you one more question. So I think we've got a couple about just the immediate environment in those um, isolation experiments. And people are asking whether indoor plants or artwork or pets um, could be ever allowed in those spaces. And if yes, then what kind of effect do you think that would have on the test subject? Yes, we had a greenhouse and it had amazing effect uh, in terms of um, the visuals and the smells. So, uh, because when you stay in uh, this confined environment, um, you have limited uh, colors that you see and texture and also the smell. But uh, with the greenhouse, when you have a new uh, plants growing and uh, this, this creates really positive uh, psychological um, aspect. 
Um, in terms of uh, pictures or paintings, that's also uh, very, uh, very positive. And uh, for this eight months duration, we added um, space pictures that took uh, our cosmonaut Rizansky and uh, um, our crew members that are training now for this, uh, they said that it's really, really um, motivates them and actually creates the atmosphere that they're really on the space station. Wonderful, thank you. Um, James, do you know if uh, folks at the VR are ready to ask a question? It looks like they yeah, are. Are you able to hear us okay? Yes, go ahead. Great. Um, yeah, thank you, Anastasia. I was wondering if you could tell us, there was a slide in your, uh, in your presentation that seemed to show VR headsets, maybe. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what's being simulated there and how you're using that? Yes, uh, so since we have this uh, hangar uh, which simulates Mars or Moon surface, uh, it's limited in space. Uh, and uh, with a serious project, we decided to combine it with VR. And uh, therefore, uh, our crew members could actually uh, expand their view on, uh, on the moon. And uh, we had the simple VR system uh, in four months uh, experiment, but for the eight months, we have quite advanced system, uh, which um, even creates the feeling that uh, of um, six, I mean, yeah, 6G, no, not 6G. I mean, the less, six times less uh, gravity that you have on moon. So um, uh, it created with the special devices uh, on which our uh, astronauts or cosmonauts are uh, hanged in uh, and using the VR. Also, um, there is special um, uh, surface that they're working on. And, um, but basically they're standing at, at one point, they're just walking on this um, very um, slippery surface. And it also creates that they're going um, long distance on the moon. Uh, and we also will use a rovers. So uh, it's interesting how it all will soon work out. <laughs> Great, thank you. Oh, and also VR for psychological support. It's, uh, we will do also tests on that uh, using VR goggles. Um, but uh, for now, it's just the videos of nature, uh, and of course, in the future, it will be perfect if you, if you have videos of your family and loved ones, but maybe it will be good or maybe it will be bad because uh, you would start to miss them even more and would be quite sad and depressed. So here it's interesting point, uh, whether we should use it or not. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, I guess we're running out of time. There's a lot of really great questions, both on the technical side and on the very interesting speculative side. Um, so, I mean, if time permits, um, I'd like to ask maybe one more question about the future of language, but if not- Go, go ahead, just... Lura. We, we have time, go ahead. Oh, wonderful. Well, there's this question from Majda and they're asking, um, as you have mentioned about the case of some language communication barrier, that didn't result in stopping the communication quality between astronauts, which is extremely impressive. So um, much is curious to know if uh, during these humans deep space flights, um, the results could be a creation of new languages in purpose to communicate effectively. And again, it's more, I think of a, just a speculative scenario. Well, as you know, on ISS, they already have this, uh, uh... Runglish or in English, how you call it. So it's a mix of Russian and English and they happily use it. So uh, I think, yes, uh, for sure, there will be um, a new space language, uh, maybe that combines several languages here from Earth. Thank we you We can take much. one more, Lyra. Oh, wonderful. Um, let's see what we got here. Um, how will... Well, the, the last question here is, how will you create the team according to the personality match, according to military structure, um, like hierarchical or something else? Uh, 
It's, it's a good question and it depends on um, our commander. So for different isolation experiments, there were uh, different types of commander, someone with a military background. So uh, he had this hierarchy in his crew and uh, some are uh, with uh, different approach so uh, that each crew member should uh, give its opinion and uh, then we decide what we should do and how we could solve it. Um, when we choose crew members, uh, we firstly, of course, look at health <laughs> because uh, our selection is uh, very strict, is, is the same as for cosmonaut selection. Uh, and we don't want to have any health problems during the long isolation period. Uh, and then, of course, we uh, consider the psychological health and um, we uh, put together 12 uh, people, uh, like a main crew and backup. But at that point, before three months before the start of the experiment, we're not sure which ones will be exactly in the main crew. And so we look at the dynamic and how they work together and train. And then um, we decide who will go. Thank you. Anastasia, thank you for being with us. I love listening to your presentations. We were delighted and I hope I get to see you in person next year. Yes, <laughs> me too. Thank you so much, amazing thank convention. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. All right, so that concludes, uh, her appearance concludes today's plenary, uh, morning plenaries. Uh, the afternoon session starts in about 30 minutes, but before that, I just want to remind everyone that although the attendance at the convention today is entirely free, um, that the Mars Society's programs, their analog research stations, all depend on the generous support of people like you. And so we hope that you'll visit our donation page uh, on our website and make a donation that um, fits with, with your own situation. And please give generously. And we'll see you in about a half an hour. Take care. Thank you, everyone. We're ending the call now. We'll see you at the